Uh, okay, so we'll start uh, with Matthew Pierre talking about the with uh, So it's 30 minutes? Yeah, just mean 25 or something. Yeah, well, so what I'm, I'm aiming to talk for uh, to leave a lot of time for discussion on okay. questions, so it should be a lot shorter than that, actually. 15 okay. minutes. Uh, so yeah, uh, hi everyone. Uh, although I am um, in Marseille and Milan, uh, I can assure you I'm as depressed about the football as pretty much everyone else in the room. <laughs> I think uh, between the Brazilians and the and the Spanish and uh, British people, I'm <laughs> depressed. But the flip side, Italians still <laughs> don't get that. <laughs> Everyone's. We're beyond. Uh, that's true. <laughs> We're all pretty annoyed about the football. Are there any French people in the room? I don't know if there are. Anyway. Um, so, <laughs> so uh, right. So I'm going to talk about Weave Curacao, not football. Uh, I'll try and keep it short. As I say, I want to leave lots of time for questions. Uh, I'm going to try and give you a flavour, very briefly, of what Weave Curacao is. I don't want to say much about it because many of you have heard about it before. I'll try and get into some of the some of the nitty gritty, tough questions about how to plan. One one thing to mention first, I think you know, you know, it's uh, we should pat ourselves on the back. Those of us in this sort of joint quasar AGN team between Weave and and uh, JFAS, because we recently got funding over six hundred thousand uh, euros between. France and uh, Brazil to support our joint activities, which is great. And although it's funding in France and Brazil, the team actually included people from Spain and people from Italy. So I think it's been a, many people doing work that aren't expecting direct funding, which is great. So we're going to that's going to start this project in March. Uh, so, yeah, uh, thanks to my, my co-coordinator, Raul, for, for his, his heroic work on this as well. Um, and right, so we have three positions open. So if you're interested, three postdoc positions, please let us know. Um, so right, a couple of uh, brief points about the, the big science questions of Weave QSO without going into it in any particular detail. So what is the point of Weave QSO? Uh, I will get into the, the details of the complementarity with JPAS in a moment, but the one thing to note initially is that it's a it, it's a, a spectroscopic survey of quasars. And if you look at the bottom right, this little image shows what happens when the quasar light leaves a quasar and passes through the intergalactic medium. You see the imprint, the, the quasar spectrum gets redshifted to the right, um, and you see this absorber. So this is the intergalactic medium, and also sometimes. The circumgalactic medium, the things like this galaxy here, imprints itself in the data too. So we want to measure large-scale structure, we want to measure galaxy formation. We can do this by measuring large-scale structures in 3D, but also studying the properties of galactic environments as well. So these are the broad goals of our team. And so on the left here, you see uh, so, you know, a, a, a sort of artistic impression of quasars in the background of large-scale structures, probing them, mapping structures in 3D by structures that traverse between lines of sight. And um, we can do things like, as illustrated, measure barren acoustic oscillations. But we can also, if you zoom in on the sort of little corners of uh, my mouth, little corners of, the, of this area, line of sight probing a particular structure, you can also learn about the, inter the inflows and outflows of gas into galaxies and understand galaxy formation. So, how does dark energy emerge to dominate the universe is one question. This is a large scale structure question, clearly, but there are other things that we can measure in large scale structure too: other quantities, growth of structure, um, various different astrophysical properties in the clustering as well. We plan to not just measure it statistically, but also produce cosmic web maps and uh, study in small scales and large scales. So that's the, the brief flavor of what Weave Curacao is and what the point is. But I'm, as, you know, if anyone's interested in knowing more, please let me know. I have to move on. Um, what is Weave Curacao in, uh, in a nutshell then from a planning perspective? So Weave Curacao is one of eight Weave surveys. Um, and in particular, we share our fields with only two teams, well, three if you include white dwarfs, but they're pretty flexible. So the two monsters in our in our survey plans are Weave Lofar and uh, Galaxy Archaeology, so Gaia follow-up. And so these uh, two, three if you include us, uh, dominate the dark time of Weave of the Weave survey. So there are some other small <clears throat> small contributions, but really this is the pretty much the dark time survey. And these two are absolute monsters, right? So they take up the overwhelming majority of the dark time 
and we're sort of riding along with these monsters, pulling in slightly different directions. But you know, the the, the interactions between these three teams are pretty harmonious on the whole, and I have to I have to give my colleagues credit in these two other survey teams. We work together pretty well uh, to find compromises uh, to to go forward. Um, so we've, you know, as you're probably aware, it, just backing up a bit, Weave itself is a new spectroscopic survey facility for the William Herschel Telescope. It has a three degree field of view. It has multi-object spectroscopy capabilities. This is what we're most interested in. And also IFUs. The Weave survey takes up 70% of the William Herschel Telescope time. Uh, and the 30% that's left is open to PI time, as JPAS people know. And that PI time can be on the Weave instrument. And we certainly hope it is for the most part because it's much more efficient that way, but there are also other instruments that may also be available. Um, the membership of Weave is actually a very open model in the sense that if you can identify a scientific motivation and you can explain you know, what is your reason for joining Weave, if you're in one of these countries, you're in, basically. <coughs> With some complexity about France but I don't, and Italy, but I don't think that concerns people in the room. So, you know, for those of you in Spain, you're welcome to join Weave at any time. Uh, you just need to contact the appropriate people for the right science team. Um, but the good news is for everyone, even people in Brazil, you know, collaboration through Weave QSO means that there's a way in to work with, uh, with Weave uh, that way as well. Uh, but more members are welcome in Spain in particular. Um, so, um, yeah, and as you may, may have heard, uh, the, fir the first light of Weave was announced yesterday. The, the 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 press release came out and this is a press release on the large IFU. So this is the mode that's up and running. It was the mode that was commissioned initially, uh, and the commissioning is almost over, not quite finished, but good enough. Uh, so that's what's shown here at the top, St Stephen's Quintet, and these are the this is the large IFU placed over. Um, over over some of the galaxies, I, I I can't say much about this partly because I haven't taken the time to read up. I'm not going to give you a full science thing. Right now. Read the press release, uh, but this is basically uh, the basic idea is that you can map out the collision between two galaxies here. This little blue galaxy here is crashing in uh, at about 800 kilometers per second into the foreground uh, red galaxy, and that's what we're seeing. And so you can obviously it's an IPU, so you can get spectra across this across this um, area. Um, so yeah, go go ahead and look at that. <coughs> so that's the good news. The bad news is that the Weave survey is delayed. So this is not something that I'm putting on the slide because I'm not sure I'm allowed to say this, but I'm going to say it anyway. So this is so this is the unofficial status of Weave now, which is that um, so the commissioning has taken longer than anticipated. We thought all the commissioning would be done now, only the library is commissioned. The con there's a much more conservative schedule now for the commissioning of the MOS and the mini IFU. And we think, so the, the, this is absolutely hot off the press. I was in the telecom <laughs> before joining you guys yesterday. You know, yeah, you guys can all keep the secret, right? I've got everyone and the people in the Zoom. <laughs> and we should delete and burn all the recordings of this presentation. <laughs> uh, so March looks like when commissioning is going to end. February, March, but let's say March. And that's when the science verification will start. So all you good people that have prepared PI time um, uh, at data, I'm afraid it's going to have to get changed again. The good news for Weave QSO and probably for you guys as well is that Mini JPAS now becomes very much observable, actually optimally observable. So maybe we don't have to start completely from scratch. Right? Uh, so, so, and this is great news for Weave QSO uh, because this is what we really wanted. So, our main science verification field, uh, Mini JPAS, is now observable, and that's what we're going to be doing. And the survey. So the survey, you know, for Weave, a quarter begins, the, the quarter is one month shift, but the first quarter starts in February. But anyway, let's say the survey will start in the second quarter of next year. So this is what you should be anticipating. And, that, and we're all aware of the fact that it gets quite difficult to go from the lessons learned in science verification in one quarter to submitted data. We need to learn from our SV and help ourselves um, how, in order to make decisions about how the survey is is uh, the survey data is, is submitted 
boring questions that I won't, uh, I won't go into can, the detail. Can you repeat this concept? It's, kind of, it's probably going to be useful for the rest of the collaboration. <laughs> that you need to learn. time from between science verification and yeah, the beginning yeah. of the survey. Can yeah. you say it again? <laughs> <laughs> you need to learn lessons from your science verification data before you start your survey. <laughs> Thanks. But, but, you have, but you've had yours for years, right? You've got many JPEGs. <laughs> so you've yeah. got lots of time. <laughs> okay, I, I know. <laughs> it's more complicated. <laughs> Just ruining the simple message for you. Um, but right, so, uh, so as I say, weave is delayed, and we'll get back to that in a moment. Uh, so, what is the relationship between JPAS and Weave QSO? <clears throat> so, I won't tell you what JPAS is, simply to say that there is an MOU signed probably years ago now, I think a year and a half ago. Um, but, you know, we've been discussing and doing uh, joint science for 10 years, I think, basically. This is a, a, long, a long discussion. Um, the RHEL uh, first had an email exchange about that long ago, uh, about this idea. So, the idea is quite simple that um, you can't study quasar absorption in JPAS. The resolution, the spectral resolution is too low. Um, and, but it is a perfect resolution, we think, to identify quasar emission lines and identify quasars. So JPAS is, is a magnificent J quasar identification machine. It's many other things too, I realize that, but for that, it's absolutely great. And, and then we've, picks up where JPAS leaves off. We can improve the quasar redshift precision, clearly. Um, we can help validate the samples, but ultimately also for us, we want to study quasar absorption and do that science. So that's the natural complementarity between the two. Um, so we have an MOU signed for this joint science, and I'll say a little bit more about what science, but the very simple and obvious one is identify quasars, get the spectra of them, and then send the spectra back. Um, there is also discretionary fiber hours as part of the MOU. There's some thousands of fiber hours uh, that have been, uh, I don't want to say awarded because I don't think that's fair. I mean, an entirely justified return for JPAS from Weave to, um, you know, you don't have to justify the reason for uh, observing those objects. It's, it's enough for JPAS to decide what they want to observe with obviously observational constraints. Um, but, you know, obviously we'll also get all those uh, quasar spectra and the potential, you know, sort of good contact with Weave to make use of other spectra as well. I mean, for example, our quasar catalog is going to include anything in, in LOFAR that ends up being a quasar. So we'll have all the Weave LOFAR quasars in our sample too. Um, so there are various different, uh, different uh, uh, advantages to be gained in ways that the two services can talk to each other. Um, not least of which is the, the direct award of, uh, to J Passive Spectrum. Um, so, as is shown here, I think it goes, yeah, I think Sylvia showed this plot earlier in the week. You, know, you can see that um, quasar emission lines are quite easily identified in mini J Pass data. This is a rich of three, rich of 4.3 quasar. And when you look at the mocks, like the ones that Kalina was telling us about, you, uh, you, you know, we have these mocks building up things like this is a red of three quasar here, a white dwarf and a, and a galaxy, I think. Uh, so it's quite clear that you can identify uh, quasar um, emission lines. And indeed, if this is actually the old tray arrangement, as, as Alessandra was saying, I was asking for this to be switched around a little bit. So these two are now, are now inverted in this sort of interleaved area. But if you look at, you know, quasar redshift and wavelength, you see, you know, you can identify a quite clear wavelength ratios through the data of where the emission lines will sit in a given filter. And so it's, it's a reasonably straightforward exercise uh, without too much degeneracy to figure out what the quasar's redshift is. <clears throat> um, there's, so there is also this joint science, which I think is, is really interesting and worth mentioning. There's the fact that we can we can cross correlate laminar forest and JPAS sources. Not all JPAS sources, not all high rate of JPAS sources will be uh, followed up spectroscopically. So we can extend it to the quasars or other objects that are not are not included. Um, so it, it, you know we expect to be getting most of those rich of greater than 2.1 quasars in general, but anything that's not, we can also throw it in. More interesting for me is the question of what happens when you directly cross-correlate the lime and alpha forest quasar spectra and the JPAS images. Now, you couldn't do an autocorrelation of a JPAS 
image or date, JPEG data cube, because you'd be swamped by so, a superposition of so many different things, right? All the galaxy populations with different redshifts, all the stellar populations with different redshifts, the sky correlated throughout the data. But if you cross correlate with a different data set that's completely different, uh, with no very few things in common, this allows you potentially to, to push right into the noise. So you would clearly do things like mask the known sources, but once you've masked those sources in JPAS, you can cross correlate JPAS spectra and, sorry, JPAS, uh, J spectra and QSO uh, low enough forest spectra. And we would expect, we, we have some projections on doing this, cross correlating to measure the Lyman alpha emitter population in the noise with the Lyman alpha forest absorption. Uh, and the interesting thing, so Pablo, credit to him, he's trying to join JPAS. So I've strongly encouraged JPAS to allow him entry. He's looking, for, he's in China trying to get through the joint access, get access through, through, through Zhenkai, I think. Um, he's very good and he helped us make projections about this. So the interesting thing about this, this idea, so this is, sorry, I should say what is being shown. This is a correlation, the projected correlation function, multiplied by R squared, and the uh, signal to noise expected in a given band. So we expect a pretty clear detection. And we don't think that we can do cosmology with this in the sense that you're not gonna probably measure growth of structure or, or BAO or anything like that, we think. But we're pretty confident that this is an entirely new measurement. I mean, basically no one's ever measured the large scale Lyman alpha emission signal in the universe. So we might be the first to do this. It's been attempted in SDSS data. There's an interesting backstory to that. Um, but if we can do that, it will be a first, but it'll also be an uh, interesting measurement, a uh, new measurement of the star formation rate of the universe at this epoch, which is an interesting epoch to study. So we think this is really interesting. The, the other thing about the story may please some people in a, you know, in an amusing way is that, so this was originally, I mean, I think Raul and I already talked about this, doing this independently, but we discovered that there was a paper of making projections on this. This is a paper on cross-correlating PAL and DESI. So huh. I know that there's a history there, but the, the answer is that PAL can't do it, but JPAS can. So this is just saying. <laughs> my uh, so, uh, so I think this is really, really interesting and exciting, and I really like the idea of combining the data directly in this way. Uh, okay, so let's talk about some more boring practical questions. Boring but important, right? So here is the uh, Weave QSO survey footprint. It's this blue line here, this outer perimeter. So I'm calling this thing Weave QSO wide. We're not expecting JPAS targets from the entire thing. The part that we are hoping for JPS targets is, is indicated in the sort of red dashed line, which I'm labeling here as WQ plus JPS. I can't call this the JPS footprint. It's not the JPS footprint, but it's our, uh, our, our, our goal overlapping strategically planned common footprint. So I'm going to keep calling this WQ plus JPS or common footprint for short. And uh, there's also this other interesting area in green, which is actually head decks. So this is our high density area. We're still gonna, so throughout the red dashed area, we're gonna try and get quasars down to the very limit of what we can achieve with JPAS data. So the really the, 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 the detection limit. Um, uh, but we do have to make some cuts in terms of redshift for, to be optimal because we have a limited access to fibers. In the head decks, we're just gonna do all the lamina for forest quasars. So it's just opens up the cuts. That's as much as I have time to say. Um, so the entire blue area is eight and a half thousand square degrees, and the common footprint WQ plus JPAS is a little under six thousand. Let's call it six thousand. So there's two and a half thousand outside, six thousand inside, and we have to plan this throughout the survey. And this is something to keep in mind. And the split is a little bit under five thousand in the north, and a little bit over one thousand square degrees in the south based on you know, the, the, the current uh, sort of draft footprint. Um, so what does it mean to do this uh, progressively? So I've had to update this, this chart more times than I care to mention, um, but here it is up to date, as of today, the, what I'm hearing about when these surveys will start, uh, it's, it really isn't just JPAS, right? It's, 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 just, it's, it's been just as delayed. There's a long history of weed delays as well. Uh, so the um, so JPAS start in January. The things that I said to you, more or less, which is we've start uh, in the second quarter. And 
the, the, we're not intending to go straight from any J pass, uh, you know, part of the sky directly or quickly to weave because of observability at different RA. Um, weave turns out to be quite flexible in terms of the RA that's visible, more so than J pass. But let's say for the sake of argument, you go year to year. So you observe in one year in J pass, you only attempt to observe the, the, the same quarter of the following year. Uh, uh, for, uh, with the targets that you found. So that's what I'm drawing here. So you basically, you write off nine months of the weave survey because um, we don't have JPAS targets quickly enough. And then from then on, you have a steady flow. So what are the conclusions from this? So the year by year, um, there's a year by year flow and it's limited by JPAS, um, the, the JPAS speed that we can uh, obtain targets in any given part of the sky. And we will start outside of non JPAS areas, as I said. Uh, and the it, so this is part of the point areas that JPAS observes outside of this WQ plus JPAS uh, footprint are areas lost for two reasons. Uh, we're, we're, we're limited in terms of speed, in the sense that if JPAS is doing other things, that's time lost. It could be growing this, this target area. And there's also the fact that wherever JPAS observes, I'll explain this again in a moment. When JPAS observe a particular area that isn't part of this plan, we will just do something different with it. And so it's it's lost because we doesn't go back. We never goes back to the same areas again. Right. So it will be observed by the shared fields, potentially observed by the shared fields separately from this scheme. And it's lost for this reason as well. So it's not just a, a, a time thing, it's also just a planning thing. Areas that aren't part of this plan are not um, are not accounted for. Uh, so I'm going to say something about the first year because so a lot of the discussions that we've been having uh, relate to this question. Some of these plots are a bit busy. Apologies for that. You should see something that looks quite similar to what I showed here. It's a bit distorted. It's more or less the same thing. But you can see the green here and the darker purple. It's not ideal, but this is a plot made by a colleague that I'm sharing with you unofficially again. Uh, <laughs> so this is JPAS, the JPAS footprint. Right, and you can see that there is this area, uh, there are these areas that are uh, 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 sort of considered to be up for grabs for year one, and it's everything that's in purple. But so this is so this is two thousand five hundred square degrees. We need one thousand five hundred, not because we can observe one thousand five hundred a year, but the schedule needs degrees of freedom. So apparently this is what we need to put forward because otherwise our survey will just lose. Other parts of the WEAVE survey will just get data that we that we are not competitive on. So in order for us to be competitive, we've been told we need to put forward 2,500 square degrees over the course of the first year, front loaded. So the first one is, is uh, has more data. So the concern is, as you can probably see, if I draw a line here, you know, this is the upper boundary of what we're discussing. So this, anything above that is, um, we're happy for Weave to go ahead and observe because we don't need JPAS targets for that. So pretty, one of the only, so this is the only area in the North, just above 60 degrees, where um, the, our colleagues are already expecting to, um, to go ahead with that JPAS data in this first few months that I said. There's also this area here, by the way, um, which is obviously limited in RA, but that's also an option. And then there's this sort of complicated area in the south, which until recent discussions uh, seemed to be the one area where we could confidently say that um, we have a, a good plan put forward, right? The, the, it, it's quite orthogonal, the area that JPAS was uh, planning on targeting and the area that, it, uh, you know, in combination with us and the area that's not. That's changing. Clearly, that's a discussion, uh, but that's one of the ongoing headaches that we need to confront. But overall, if you just if you just look at this area, you can say yes, we can come up with a year's worth of data without needing JPAS. Now, I you know we don't need a year, right? We need nine months. It depends on the time of year it's observable. Maybe JPAS at Weave is flexible enough that it can quickly start to put on the queue things that JPAS is observing earlier. It's a little bit more complicated than I'm making, but if you want to look at a conservative picture, it's a prudent thing to do to put forward a year's worth of uh, bees, a year's worth of observations without JPAS data needed so that people can just sort of go about their business in a calm way. So that doesn't appear to be possible based on the discussions that we're currently hearing. 
Uh, okay. So, <laughs> but you know, one one. So, firstly, one question is, what is the area that we can all agree we can make a start on? We've shared surveys can make a start on. But maybe the other question is, okay, well, why don't we just change it? So, what you know, I, I just you guys tell me what I need to do, and then I'll go and I'll just tell my shared survey colleagues. <coughs> oh, we need to do. We, we agreed this thing, but we just need to do something different. I mean, I'd be more than happy to do that, but there are limits. And the limits, it may not be very easy to see in this plot, but the, the real problem is Weeb Lofar with regards to the South in particular. The pink areas, here are the areas where Weeb Lofar at least has the data process that it could target now. And this is the North. I know it's not very well labeled, but you can, you can see the familiar shapes with the, with the weird H Atlas cut out. And, and in the South again, so this is the area that we blow far is ready to observe and it doesn't cover some of the uh, southern areas that we've been discussing which means that if we just say oh it's okay you know we've um, we've low far just observed somewhere else but they're not ready to do that so okay uh, i think that's getting quite complicated so i i just want to illustrate maybe i can explain more if need be that there are there's there's there are degrees of freedom in some areas uh, and and not others, and I so part of the planning of these red areas and the the, the overall WQ plus J plus footprint is a pre-existing plan fixed some years ago, which was actually partly expressed by J passes requirements. So one of the reasons why we have this pink area, I shown it or maybe easier to see in this plot. One of the reasons why we have this WQ plus J plus boundary is because what we were told J plus needed. So this is what we communicate. Times change, but I just wanted to point that out. So this was a common agreed area. Uh, anyway, so we have some challenges to face, um, but we have weave delays help us to try and achieve it because it means that there's less time without J plus data in which we want to minimize. Um, I'm going to stop there. I don't have questions. I don't have conclusions. I just have suggested questions that you could ask um, based on the previous discussions. Uh, and maybe I'll run on a little bit, but if there's time, uh, we can ask them. Thank you. OK, so yeah, we are right on time. We may have time for a couple of questions. I have a couple. <laughs> So, uh, do you expect to fill most of the uh, fibers with resource or with something else? Um, so, the shared survey area that I was referring to is two thirds galaxy archaeology, on, on, typically. And then the final one third is split more or less evenly between Weave Lofar and Weave Curacao. So, we have slightly more. So, the, the science plans we have take us right to the limit of our allocation in Weave Curacao. Having said that, um, JPAS has an allocation, and that allocation, you know, it's to be determined exactly how JPAS uses this. It's somewhat dependent, I think, on the amount of common area that we, we can work out together. But a natural thing might be for JPAS to have some number of fibers per field, if that's something JPAS wants, or some dedicated fields, if that's what JPAS wants. Yeah. And um, since you are mostly interested in the Lyman Alpha forest, yeah. would you also have said? Um, well, so our cuts are based on, um, well, I mean, it's actually something that's open to question. And generally speaking, we do need to optimize for the blue. And that's usually presented as an R band magnitude, R band magnitude limit. Um, it could be G band, but that's complicated because of the absorption. But we also keep it open the possibility that we have some sort of J pass optimized. We don't have to use it at a broad band magnitude to do it. But generally speaking, yeah, it's going to be. Built on, you know, but you know, saying that we might still have some quite red quasars, red quasars that still meet our sort of G of R of 23.5 limit. They might be red quasars. Okay, yeah, so there's nothing else. We thank Matt again. Yeah. <laughs>
Okay, all right. Okay, wow, so, that's small. Uh, yeah, so when you figure out that, uh, next we have Raul Abraham talking about cosmology today. So, some of the stuff that I'm going to say, I probably, uh, you probably heard it before. It's just a general motivation for this. Uh, as you know, JPASS is very unique in the sense that it can find all kinds of different uh, extragalactic objects, all kinds of different traces of large scale structure. And this is really what sets JPASS apart from uh, other surveys. We're not targeting specific types of galaxies. We're not just saying we're going to observe red galaxies or emission line galaxies, like some of the other surveys are doing. We actually are able to see a lot of things. And what allows us to see into deeper, very deep into, uh, into time and space is uh, the quasars, which can be seen to very high redshifts. And we are here, uh, we have the opportunity to actually extend our survey from redshift zero to up to redshift four or so. Um, but we need help with that because it's not so simple. Quasars are not that dense of a tracer, they're rare. Um, we can overcome that by combining the quasars with the Lyman Alpha Forest, and then we can have basically a map of structure from zero to four in all kinds of different traces. And I think this is a unique uh, uh, thing about uh, JPASS. And you can see here, for instance, uh, the present situation with the uh, large scale large scale structure with e, uh, with uh, Sloan and EBOS. You see that at different red chips, they are they, uh, they are able to target different objects. So maybe this figure is a bit small, but you can see that you start with the general galaxy population, low red chips, then you move to different types of galaxies, and then finally, you have uh, here we have quasars and you have a Lyman alpha over in this region here, right? Uh, for red chip space distortions, the same except that you don't get that uh, at least not right now with Lyman alpha forest, but you can go up to high red chips with quasars also. So this is the situation right now. We want to extend that and we can use the fact that we see all these uh, spectral features. These are nice uh, animations by Alberto Molino. And if you see this, you can immediately realize that you can distinguish, not, you can not only measure, it's not only a, a question of measuring photos, this is a question of distinguishing all different kinds of type of galaxies. And this is really what we have, a huge number of galaxies that we know what they are and we know where they are. Of Quasar specifically, this, this movie here tells you about all the different ways that a quasar may appear to you. They are pretty much the same object, they're all redshifts, but you can see at that movie that's running here that they appear very different uh, to us depending on which uh, redshift you have, right? This is like basically continuum, but then if you go to high redshift, then you start seeing more and more emission lines. So many objects in one. Detecting, classifying, finding those objects is a challenge. Um, and here is, uh, anyway, here is a, situation right now as for the density of traces that people have been using. Um, this is uh, this is latest from EBOS. So you see you have a galaxy probably here at lower redshift, then you have a CMAS uh, sample, then you have basically uh, uh, luminous red galaxies here at redshift one and emission line galaxies at redshift 1.1, something like this. And above that, you have to have quasars. And above 2.2, you have the Lyman Alpha Forest, which you are able to probe through absorption. What we want to do is uh, summarize here. So this is a plot that was uh, in the mini JPAS paper, which I think is very useful. And there are many things to be seen here. Um, and this is basically what you see here is JPAS uh, in the bo bo uh, boxes and, and the circles, depending on whether you have the whole population or a more high signal to noise population. Uh, this is excellent. We're actually doing quite similar to DASI, for instance, which basically is finished doing the size verification of their tracer populations, galaxies, and quasars. And this is uh, this is how we do for the uh, in comparison with DASI for galaxies. For the let's say blue galaxies, we are a bit below in density compared to DASI. With the red galaxies, we are also a bit below compared to DASI. That's mini JPAS data. It's not JPAS, but you know, that's the idea. Uh, so we are close to DASI, but DASI has a higher density of objects than we have, and of course they have a spectra. Um, here is what how we are doing with respect to quasars. Uh, even DASI has a complete has basically a seventy percent uh, completeness in the for the general population up to up to a magnitude of twenty three point two. 
We are able, on the other hand, as you have seen the other talks today, to do better than 90% up to a uh, magnitude of 23.5. So we are actually doing better than DESI, and we are capable of doing better than DESI. We are capable of being the best Quasar survey out there if we are able to do it. Of course, we have to verify that, and the science verification from DESI actually, you can see that there is a slight difference here. This is what they were planning, the dashed and the upper here in green is what they actually got from science verification. So they're actually doing better than they planned, right? But we can do better than that by, you know, we can improve that by a large fraction. We can see up to redshift 2.2 just by ourselves with our quasars, some of which might have a spectroscopic follow-up, some of which, most of which probably not. And then above 2.2, we can use not only quasars, but uh, Lyman Alpha. That's the motivation basically. Uh, well, I'll, I'll skip these challenges because people have talked about them here. I think this is an interesting plot, just to, just for you guys to have an idea of the scale of the enterprise. Here is the number density per square degree of stars in red, galaxies in green boxes here. And this is where, where the quasars are. They are always 100 times more rare than anything else and any magnitude that you're looking for, sometimes even more. So they are really hard to find. Not really, not trivial at all. Only after you do many, many different cuts and you throw away lots of things that you start to get a sample which is a bit uh, less contaminated, but then still you have to overcome a huge number of contaminants. So basically that's the, that's the, um, that's the scale of the challenge here. So this is a very complete sample compared to with HSC is about 99% completeness. Um, but it goes for point sources up to here, as you can see in red, and for extended sources up to here. Uh, sorry, it's extended sources around. the other way around. Extended sources is here, point sources is over there. So you know we have to we have to. It's not a it's not an easy task, and it's an, a task for which we we really need to to have confirmation at some point. This is uh, this is another plot that's very important here. I think I'll just call your attention here to the problem of stars, for instance, even though it's not the only problem. Here is the um, is basically the relative uh, target density for DESI science verification as a function of the stellar density per square degree, and you can see that there's a huge variation. So, Carlos, you what you're saying today about the, have, knowing how many objects you have. This is these are your templates basically, okay? And it's dominated sometimes by stars, sometimes by just the galaxies that you are basically even. So it's between uh, spectrum, okay, target, okay. Yeah, right. So here is an interesting plot also. This is basically the, it, it correlates with the Sagittarius stream, which is over here. And there's a big chunk of stars in there. You have to take care of those things also. It's something that, you know, a careful, uh, a careful yeah. identification has to be, has to be aware of those, uh, of those uh, structures in our own galaxy. Um, here is also another interesting plot because what we've been doing so far, and you've heard this from Ignacy and from Carolina, that we concentrated on point sources as sources as being our QSO targets. This is also from the DESI science verification paper. If you look at low redshifts, then you do lose a few, quite a few objects which are not point sources probably because you have the galaxy there, which is resolved. You can see the galaxy and then it's not a point source. But if you go to higher redshifts, it's a very small number. So it's probably not worth paying the price of, of just admitting extended sources into your catalog of uh, targets uh, because of just two or 3% of uh, objects, because you're going to allow in a whole world of galaxies that is going to act as contaminants. So that's also an interesting plot here. Uh, that's very useful for us. Okay. Lessons learned. That's okay. for DESI, for us. That's, that, that, that's the science verification, right? So they have the targets, they have the, the basically the pipeline for the target uh, mm -hmm. selection, and then they go out, they go and they measure the spectrum, they verify, okay. right? Yeah. This is something we have to do if uh, science verification actually begins in uh, the, the first semester of, of, uh, of next year, then we will have something like this for, for JPEGs. Uh, okay, this is redshifts here. We can do very good redshifts. So, of course, if we do have spectra, then we have perfect redshifts, no problem. But if, even if we don't have spectra, we can do a pretty darn good job of getting a photo Z from quasars here. Okay, so this is how well you can do. These lines here are 
those uh, line uh, line degeneracies because if you have a line, you have two lines here, the ratio between two lines is redshift independent, so that's why you have these lines off the diagonal here. But anyway, it's something that you also have in galaxies, no, no big deal. Anyway, uh, all right, I'll skip this part here. We actually need something like this plot for the quasars. Also, we have this for Mini J Pass because Mini J Pass has actually plenty of galaxies. Here's just a taste of what you can do for cosmology. I mean, uh, nobody has shown this before, but you know, this is, I mean, apart from all kinds of stuff related to the uh, cosmology, BAOs, structure formation, history of galaxy formation, and so on, there's more that you can do. And actually, uh, this is something that I'm very much interested in. I think from the beginning was something that drew, drew my attention. If you look at uh, primordial non gaussianities this is one of the most important cosmological parameters that's up for grabs. Somewhere, sometime in the future, somebody will detect this. I don't know, from yeah. CMB or some, yeah. something else. Right now, the constraints are of order one from Planck. Uh, uh, yeah, order one, I, I said. <laughs> Understood. Yeah, it's five actually from Planck. But from large scale structure, right now, the EBOS uh, QSO survey, which is the best for constraining FNL, gives you an error bar of 20. So 10 plus or minus 20. Okay. Now, DESI is forecast to have an FNL error of about 10. Spherex, which is a space probe, and I think this number is. I think this number is a bit uh, unrealistic. Huh? Uh, it says they are going to be, be able to do two. I'm saying we are able to do between two and four <coughs> before these guys are doing this. So this is going to be the best measurement, even compared to Planck, if we can do the whole survey. This is based on, so this is uh, 8,000 square degrees. This is 4,000 square degrees here. So it's about the same level as Planck maybe even a bit, a bit better. So we can be the best survey for uh, primordial non energy. So just conclusions, just to motivate why this is important. We can be the leading survey for quasars. We can be better than uh, DESI. And that's something that we have to, I mean, what, what's the competition out there? We can be the best QSO survey. We can rely on our own data for Z less than, uh, redshift less than 2.2 quasars. Uh, the highest value, though, is for the high redshift objects, where we have this really excellent opportunity to team up with WEAVE uh, QSO. But the synergy here is really important. It's time sensitive. We select it, we observe with JPASS, we observe with WEAVE. Both of these surveys, they, they, both of these instruments are not driven by a single survey. JPASS is not a QSO survey. WEAVE is not a QSO survey. We all have different interests. But where we match, we are able to do uh, this amazing survey. Uh, so what we need is to have uh, a, a synergy in a certain area that we observe, that we grow in, in tandem, uh, in a syn synchronized. So the survey growth is really critical. Something like 800 square degrees a year, optimally even a bit more, is what, uh, is what uh, will allow us to make this amazing survey. So, if we succeed, if we can do this, then we'll be basically the first continuous map of cosmic structures from redshift zero to redshift four. And this is, I think, a big, big uh, deal that we can achieve with the survey here. So just some motivation here for why I think we, sure, should, sure. we should try to do this. Okay, I think I'll stop there. I have a few more slides, but I really, I think. Okay. So, uh, well, I'm not an expert at all in this field, so but I have the question. After seeing here. so many of our talks, <laughs> <and why? laughs> I mean, uh, why it is suspected that we have a, a less error for, in our measurements of the amplitude of the primordial non axial distortion with respect yeah. to DAC? Right, so uh, we have more objects. Right, we can uh, we we can cover a higher a, a, a different redshift range also. Uh, Desi is kind of focusing in some in some range there, right? So we have a higher density of objects that makes a big difference because uh, okay, F and L is a measure of structure on all scales, so it's on large scales, but it has to be equilibrated by small scales. 
On small scales, you're really hurting by shot noise. So if you go into small scales, if you have a very, a very um, rare sample, a very faint, very, uh, if your number density is too, too low, you cannot re really reach to the smaller scales. And uh, with more numbers, you can. So you can combine all kinds of things. So another thing is that we are not only relying on quasars. We are relying on all different redshifts. So we combine different redshifts from redshift 0.5 to 1 with galaxies, then from 1 to 2.2 with quite quick, well, from 1 and up to 4 with quasars. So we combine different tracers at different redshifts. So it's not only the quasars, right? By the way, the DESI FNL constraint is also based on more tracers, but they have less overlap of the different tracers. We have more. So. And that's independent of the. I mean, it's only the, the error only depends on the GFAS data. I mean, they don't need to, the, to do the with uh, uh, observation or this also based on the spectrum. Yeah, right. So, yeah. So, uh, the way that I did my forecasts, I allowed for uh, error in the identification of quasars between redshift one, in between redshift up to redshift 2.2. I'm assuming that we have, we are basically, we don't have a big, um, a big verification scheme. So the error bar for the misidentification of quasars is larger for redshift 2.2, and it's basically zero for redshift above 2.2 because we have we. This is what I'm allowing. If you're asking me what would happen if we did have we have zero, um, uh, we have no weave for higher redshift, then I don't know what what the answer is. It would be lower. I don't know how much lower. But, yeah. Okay, so uh, actually, uh, okay. it's one. I question. just want to ask a question. Um, do we understand on these large scales where FNL can be measured, there are PR effects, general relativistic effects? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do we understand I'm very those? interested in those also. Yeah. There is, yeah, I, I, I have a paper exactly on the mixing between those relativistic effects and, and the, and the uh, okay. FNL. Scale dependence helps break the degeneracy, but that's a technical discussion we can have yeah. somewhere else. Okay, let's check it out. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, I think we have to okay. move on. Mm -hmm. All right, yeah. thanks. Okay, so next is uh, Rodrigo. If you can share your screen. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Um, and uh, yeah, see your presentation now. Okay. Um, let me do the presentation mode. Open my camera. So Rodrigo will take uh, talk again about the star galaxy quasar classification in J plus. Yeah. So go ahead. Yeah. Okay. So first of all, thank you uh, for the opportunity and. Um, uh, this is a work in collaboration with uh, uh, many people, uh, Valerio Marra, Miguel Quartin, uh, Luciano Casarini, and Pedro Bacchi. Um, okay, so this is a brief uh, outline of the presentation. Uh, so I will brief introduction uh, the, 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 the problem. I will present the machine learning process we have used for, for the classification. Uh, the, the performance in the validation uh, test uh, set and um, I will present some classifications of the full uh, J plus data release tree analysis. At the end, the conclusions and perspectives. So basically the, the main objective here is provide a reliable uh, galaxy star quasar classification using machine learning methods, supervised methods I will mention about the training set um, and uh, using features provided by J plus and J pass observations. Uh, just to mention that uh, uh, this, this work appeared today on archive and it has been submitted to monthly notes. Okay, uh, the first detail here is that we are using uh, one versus all method, which means that instead of uh, considering a classifier that can classify um, between the, the three classes we have, which are stars, galaxies, and quasars, we have actually three different classifiers, three different binary classifiers. So at the end, each of the binary classifiers will give a probability 
uh, a probability of each object of being a galaxy, probability of each object of being a star, and the probability of uh, each object of being a quasar. And um, these probabilities are a priori independent in the sense that uh, they, they are not normalized in the sense that uh, the, the sum of the probability uh, is not necessarily equal to one. And we can have at the end, uh, we, we can normalize these probabilities uh, just by dividing uh, by the sum of, of them. Uh, however, uh, in the case we, we want to use the highest probability criterion for, class, for classification, we can use this normalized uh, probability with tilde denoted with this tilde. However, we must be careful. Um, th this normalized probability can be uh, a bit misleading. Uh, let, let us consider th this example. If we have an object, uh, we don't know um, uh, how to classify it. It can, it can have a probability of 0 0.8 of being a galaxy. So only 8% of prob probability of being a galaxy, 1% of probability of being a star and 1% of probability of being a quasar. And then when we take this uh, normalized probability, it has 80% of probability of, of being in a galaxy. So, but at the end, uh, honestly speaking, we, we don't know uh, actually uh, which, which class uh, this, this object belongs to. So um, at the end of the day, uh, we will provide a, a, a catalog with the binary probabilities. And this is an important issue. I will discuss uh, more uh, at the end of the presentation, how it affects uh, the classification of the, the full uh, J plus uh, data release three catalog. Okay, so um, as, I, uh, as, a, as I said, uh, we are using a machine learning process. So um, for the features, we consider 37 features in total. Uh, all day, uh, of course, I, are provided by the J plus and JPS catalog. So we use photometry. We use the 12 photometric bands uh, provided in, in J plus with their respective errors. Uh, we have, uh, we also consider this uh, one, two, three, four, five, six colors uh, that are presented here. We also consider some morpholo morphology um, um, quantities uh, like the concentration, Authenticity and and so on. They, they, these are important to, to distinguish between point like point like sources or or um, extended sources. We also consider the the reddening uh, in the R band as one of the features and the point spread function. So at, in total, at the end, uh, thirty seven features. Um, this is our train catalog. Uh, at the end, uh, so basically uh, for training our machine learning. Um, classifier, we use a subset of the J plus data release three uh, cross-matched with three different catalogs. The first one is the, the SDSS data release 12. Uh, they, they have a spectroscopic uh, classes well determined. So if they are stars, galaxies, or quasars, um, this catalog, it can be easily downloaded from the, the J plus uh, ADQL protocol and we have uh, about 500,000 objects uh, divided in between these numbers of galaxies, stars, and quasars. Uh, we also have considered the, the LAMOS to data release seven. Uh, we, we did uh, uh, the cross match uh, uh, with the LAMOS data release seven. And uh, in this case, we have um, about uh, um, uh, 13,000 uh, of galaxies, uh, 7,000 of quasars. Uh, which is not too much, but we have more or less uh, about 1 million of stars in this cross match. Uh, here, the, uh, in, um, in order to do, don't have a, an imbalanced data set, we, we made some uh, quality cuts uh, in, the, in, the star, in the stars, uh, in the stars cross match. Uh, here, we have uh, only used objects uh, for the most with probability uh, in, in class star and SGLS, which are classified, uh, we already have in J plus. Uh, we only consider objects with class star and SGLS uh, bigger than 0 0.7. Uh, actually, uh, still we, we have much uh, much more objects than than uh, we we considered reasonable for not having an imbalanced data set training set. 
So we considered uh, uh, 500,000 uh, uh, stars uh, took in a, in a random sample of these remaining stars with, with, uh, that satisfy the, this uh, probability uh, condition. We have also used the, the cross match with Gaia data release three, and uh, we have uh, two hundred thousand galaxies, more or less uh, one hundred uh, thousand uh, um, quasars, uh, more or less. And here uh, there is an, an important comment: um, the, the Gaia data release three, they have the galaxy candidates uh, data set and the quasar candidates data set but they have the purer uh, candidate. And uh, we, we did the cross match with this purer um, uh, candidates data set. So we are using only the, the, the objects that Gaia considered the, uh, the, the, with highest purity and completeness for, for being galaxies and quasars. Um, considering the cross match with stars, we have uh, something about 20 million of stars in the cross match. So again, uh, uh, in order to don't have this imbalanced data set, we apply uh, some quality cuts. Here, uh, we, we, we apply the, the quality cut uh, uh, that, um, that means that all objects must have probability in class stars and SGLC equals to one. And uh, again, we have something about 1 million, which is too much for us. And uh, we got uh, 500,000 uh, random objects in this sample that satisfy this quality cut. So at the end, uh, this is the, the, the training set. Uh, so uh, we have in total um, something about 2 million of objects uh, divided into uh, galaxies, stars, and quasars. Uh, something about 1 million of stars, 500,000 of of galaxies and the rest of places. Um, okay, uh, so the first uh, step uh, uh, before um, applying the, the machine learning process is try to understand if this data set is representative. So here uh, it follows some um, some uh, contour contour plots uh, contour plots and uh, some histograms of the quantities we found that they they are more important in the classification. So we have concentration here. We have the color U minus G, uh, I minus Z, and uh, uh, at least in this in this triangle plot, uh, we can see that quantities are uh, kind of uh, uh, they, they cover uh, more or less uh, the same uh, the same range. So we consider that our training set, even though the number is not um, uh, the ideal, uh, we consider that we are covering more or less. Uh, all the region that we have in the in the full data, data set. Here we, we also have the the, the R band uh, histogram, uh, which is not exact. Our training set uh, doesn't cover uh, too much uh, the, the high the high um, values of R band magnitude, but we uh, R band is not exactly uh, in a very important feature in the in the um, in the machine learning process. Okay, so uh, one of the important points is to decide which pipeline, uh, which machine learning pipeline uh, we should use. Uh, here, instead of uh, choosing uh, uh, a given uh, method, we use this auto machine learning uh, techniques. Uh, uh, nowadays, there are many, many auto machine learning tools uh, from Google, from Keras, and so on. We have used a teapot. Um, and what is the idea of Teapot? Teapot finds uh, you the, the best pipeline uh, for, your, for your problem. So we give uh, uh, the input, uh, the training set, actually 80% of the training set, and then uh, it makes all these, these red uh, tasks. So it can pro provide a feature selection, uh, which means that it can remove some uh, useless features if, if it founds uh, it can do this fetch feature processing, which means rescale some of the features. It can uh, build the new features, uh, combining existing features. Uh, then uh, it it goes to the to the model selection itself, which, which means uh, try to find uh, which uh, machine learning method is the most uh, um, appropriate for for the problem. And here there's something interesting. Uh, instead of 
uh, only looking for different methods, uh, Teapot allows you to stack stacking different methods. So you can use more than one method and you can uh, take advantage of the best of, of the of all the methods. And at the end, it provides also the, the meta, meta parameters optimization. So at the end, output give, gives you uh, uh, the very pipeline uh, you should use in your problem. In our case, even though uh, Teapot allows you to, to stack in different methods, uh, Teapot returned uh, only XGB, which is uh, extreme G-boosting, uh, which is the model we have used here. Okay, so now we, can, we, we should validate uh, our model in the, in the validation set. So these are uh, results uh, in, the, in the data set of the training set that, that had not been used in the fitting process. So here we can see that in the rock curve uh, for galaxies, stars, and quasars, uh, they, they perform very well um, with, with a score uh, bigger than 0 0.98 in, in, all, in all cases. And uh, here is the, the purity and completeness uh, curve. Uh, here we can see, for instance, if we have 80% uh, of completeness, uh, we, can, we have uh, something about 90% of purity for quasars uh, in something uh, very close to 100% of purity for stars and galaxies. Uh, so we consider that uh, our, our classifier performs very well in the validation set. Uh, here is a, a comparison with the, the classifiers that uh, are already in J+. So we compared our Teapot XGB with class star and SGLC. And we compare only, only for galaxies because uh, um, we compare only for extended uh, sources, not point light sources because uh, only our classifiers divide in stars and galaxies. So to be fair, we compare only for galaxies and even though uh, our classifier performs better uh, in this validation set. Here is the purity and completeness for the comparison as well. And again, uh, our classifier performs uh, a bit better than SGLC and class stars. Um, here is, a, is an interesting analysis in the validation set. We divided in, in beams of R band magnitude so lower than 19, uh, between 19 and 21 and bigger than 21. And we can see purity and completeness. And we can see, for instance, for galaxies that uh, we, we have um, an improvement for, for brighty, um, for, for brighty beings. And, uh, um, but, but still we have a, a very, very good results for the other, other beings uh, in our band. Uh, for stars, uh, we can see that uh, R equal to 19 is almost perfect. And uh, if we have fainter, sorry? Sorry, Rodi. Yeah, we are, uh, if you can be finishing, we are already over the time. Okay. Uh, and for galaxies, we have a, a little uh, uh, worse performance. Okay, here is the, the, the feature importance. So basically for galaxy concentration and PSF for stars as well. And for quasars, uh, we have uh, that photometry is, is something uh, important. Uh, okay, just to finish, uh, this is the, the full classification uh, of the of the JPS, uh, of the J plus ca catalog, the trees three, three, but is this result fully reliable? And actually this is an important point. As I said, uh, we, we give uh, um, here, it seems that the number of quasars is too much. And indeed, if we compare the performance of the classifiers compared, comparing with the validation set, we can, we can find that our classifier applied to the, the entire uh, uh, catalog, it, ha it has a lot of objects with probability less than 0 0.5, that, that is the, the highest probability. So all these objects in the full uh, J plus um, data set that has the highest probability, uh, the highest binary probability less than 0 0.5, we consider that uh, they don't have exactly a, a, a trustful classification. So what we, uh, what we, we, we think uh, on, on this, this full classification, uh, we should consider some P cuts, some quality cuts on the probabilities. So here I'm just showing the, the, this, the, the full 
catalog histograms if we assume only objects with binary probabilities bigger than 0 0.5, 0 0.7, and 0 0.9. 0 0.9 would be the super pure uh, classified objects, but we don't have too much uh, objects and, uh, and uh, we have intermediate cases. So depending on the problem, if you need more completeness or more purity, you can control uh, the, uh, that's why we are giving at the end uh, the binary probabilities. So you can control depending on the problem, uh, how pure or how complete uh, is your data set. So uh, let me finish with the conclusion in perspective. So uh, as uh, uh, for perspectives, we want to uh, increase uh, the, the training set, uh, the, uh, the more data J, J plus uh, has and uh, the, the more the, the cross match uh, we can do. Uh, with all the catalogs, we can improve data set because note that we are only using a training set of about 5%, which is not the ideal number. And we also have as a perspective applying this method for JPEGs. So thank you very much. So, okay, we are over the time. Uh, it's, if it's a quick question or... So I, I have one that's a very short comment, which yeah. is just simply that um, I think you're not using uh, DR16 of the quasars, you're not using EBOS, so you miss out on all the regit below two quasars, I don't know if you can hear me. So, um, I think you said you're using DR12, I would recommend using DR16. Yeah, thank you. Indeed, we have used the data release 12 because the catalog is already provided in the J plus uh, ADKL web page, but we can work on the, this, this full cross match. Thank you. Okay, so yeah, I think we should uh, go on to the last talk of the session by Jorge Carvano. Uh, if you could uh, share your screen Enjoying that, just a minute. Uh, okay. I listen. So it's now we are moving to asteroid. Right. Yeah. Uh, so, well, thank you. Good afternoon. Yes, yeah, so I, I think you, you can have it full screen. I think your presentation uh, um, is not on, on full screen. Uh, no. Oh, right. Yeah, sure. Of course. It's not the first screen. So now it should be. Uh, yeah, no. Yes. Thanks. Right. Thanks. So now for something completely different. Uh, this is a work where uh, we are presenting uh, how we are uh, collecting and, and analyzing asteroid data from J+. So the people listed here are the ones that are directly involved in this particular work. But we also have a lot of collaboration in the, in the beginning with a lot of people from the J Plus Club collaboration, in particular, uh, Tamara Severa. So um, starting with why we study asteroids. The minor bodies in general, they are leftovers from planetary formation, and uh, collision fragments of those, those uh, uh, leftovers. So the composition of the asteroids reflect what the form. So we can map now where they are. We can understand how, uh, put constraints on models that uh, of solar system formation and evolution. So these objects have uh, sizes from meters to 500 kilometers. Uh, the biggest ones are, are the, the planetisms that survive it. The smaller ones are uh, collision fragments of those. So the, the, the bigger tends to be more round. Uh, the smaller um, have odd shapes, but they can also be round because uh, when they have verbal pires. So these objects, they have a rotation, of course. The, the rotation periods are from minutes to days, a medium value of eight, eight hours. So they are uh, the ultimate variable source because they move, uh, they change position and the magnitude also changes because of the rotation and because of the changing configuration uh, of, uh, between the, the asteroid orbit and the Earth orbit during the observations. So the colors of the asteroids, they relate to composition um, and they also change with the, the geometry of observations with phase effects. So what can you get from uh, asteroid observations? Uh, we can get light curves. So if, if you get photometry from long enough, you see the, the magnitude changing due to the rotation. And then we can uh, we can try to get the, the rotation period and also the direction of the rotation pole and even the shape if you have uh, um, the data, uh, many uh, uh, data with uh, good uh, coverage. So, and then we have the spectrum. 
And the spectra uh, uh, reflects the composition. When you talk spectra, we're talking reflecting spectra. The spectra divided by the solar spectrum, how they reflect the light. So the, the composition, they, they have uh, these broad features we're seeing here. So we can very easily uh, 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 codify that with photometry. So we can use photometry to get taxonomy that uh, different spectral types and then try to correlate that with, with mineralogy. So what can we can, can do uh, with uh, photometric surveys like JPAS? One thing is color and taxonomy. So uh, we, uh, we get, basically we want to get colors for a large enough set of asteroids so we can start doing statistics. So to, to get that, uh, you, you need observations on multiple filters that are close enough in time so we can uh, uh, not uh, be contaminated by the, the change of magnitude dur duration. So, and also you can do light covers. If you have uh, data that covers a, a, a wide enough interval, we can start trying to see how the, the light curve changes and, and then try to relate that with uh, rotational properties. So, but you get time. So Z, Z plus, as we all know, we have 12 filters covering the visible. Uh, we're doing uh, three exposures per filters and we take about an hour uh, from the first observation, the first filter to the, to the last observation of the last filter. So we have a fixed sequence of filters that they use during the observations that this one. So we have some advantages of uh, uh, narrow band surveys as, as lower. Uh, we have more filters, so we can have, in principle, a better definition of the classes. And also we have more filters covering UV, which is important. Uh, the caveat, a big caveat here, is that we have, uh, uh, the since we, 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 we take one hour to get out the data, our data will be contaminated by, by rotation. So we know that from the start, uh, we've been trying to, to, to minimize the effect to correct for that for a long time. Uh, in the meanwhile, we made a paper uh, from the observations with that one. So, and, and here we, we, we just ignore this effect. So we made a sort of detections from the combined frames using a third party pipeline. And we used solar colors from the stars in DL1. We got a bit more than 3000 asteroids uh, on DL1. About 10% of those, they, they have a spectra on the top filters. So when you look the spectra we got uh, from uh, this, this exercise, most of them are compatible with what we expect uh, our asteroid spectra. And also we can compare this to, to literature data and they more or less match. But we have a, a, a quite a, a few, uh, quite a, a few numbers of, the, of those that we have a very strange spectrum. So some examples we have uh, here, the symbols are spectra from literature and the blue line are the spectra we get uh, from J plus data. So this one is it matches that they look reasonable and match the literature data. Same thing here, but not here. So this jagged form you have uh, is not uh, anything you expect from us, right? And it's different from, from what we got from other observations. So this is clearly a rotation effect. So now we have uh, to finally perfected a way to, to solve this, at least for the brighter objects. So we made an algorithm that tried to separate color from rotations. And to do that, we, we need all the three observations on every filter. So we, we made several tests. We, we made a set of, of artificial light caps to validate the data, it works. And then we implemented a, a moving object detection uh, pipeline that works on individual frames. Uh, tested it uh, on the R2 and we're now processing the R3. So uh, this pipeline, essentially we operate on catalogs. We don't, have, don't need to use the images. So uh, we, we simply compare the positions of the, the uh, the catalogs of different filters doing a filter uh, acquisition sequence. And then we define which, what, what is a moving object. And then we uh, propagate ephemerates of the no asteroids to find them in the images. So uh, we did a test run for DR2. So we processed out the 42,000 individual frames of about 300 nights. Uh, uh, not our asteroids are detected on filters, of course. The, 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 the fainter ones tend to be detected only on the red filters. So here, I, I said we, we, we segregated in groups uh, to show how uh, effective uh, the detection is. So the first group has a, the other uh, asteroid detected on at least three images. The second, the asteroid with detection on four filters. Uh, the, th the third, detection on four filters, including a blue filters. And the fourth, detection on all 12 filters. So here, uh, we are listed then according to the dynamic populations, the first four objects that are closer to the Earth. Then you have the Ungaris and Focaeus that are in the border of the main belt and the main belt asteroids. Then we start going moving 
uh, auto heart yield the estrogens and the adjacent objects that, that includes the, the, the centaurs and the TNOs. So in the frame, as well as they were in the frame to observations, we have something something like uh, 3,000, uh, 3, uh, 30,000 objects. Of those, we have 10,000 detections on at least uh, three images. Uh, we have 7,000 on at least four filters, 3,000 on, on four filters, including a blue filters, and uh, uh, 460 uh, on the 12 filters. So this is how they are distributed according to magnitude. So the first panel, the, the top panel, uh, are the, the, the asteroids in the field, in the, uh, regardless we detect or not. Then you have the asteroids with, with at least three detections, then uh, detection on four filters, four filters including blue, and then finally the 12 filters. In here, what we haven't detected. So we are going to detect asteroids up to uh, go a bit further than minus 20 and the visible. This is a, pro a projected magnitude of the asteroids. Uh, so we can get now compare the reflection spectra we get from what we got before. So they mostly match. Uh, some don't, but uh, don't ask why. So in the left, we see in, in red the reflection spectra we got from this exercise. In blue, the one we got uh, from Moja. And uh, on the right, we have the light curves. So you see the spectrum mostly matched, and we should see that funny uh, shape spectrum. Uh, to separate the, the, the rotation uh, from the, 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 the colors, uh, we make some hypothesis. We, we assume that asteroids doesn't change with rotation with true for most of the asteroids. And also that the rotation period is much larger than time to acquire the exposures for a future. We are assuming that we have also three exposures per future. So what you do essentially is to, to fit a straight line to, to a set of two observations on each filter, and then we extrapolate to the next filter and make the difference, something like this. So we fit a, a straight line same net to the observation on filters, do the same thing for the, 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 the next filter, and then we interpolate for the uh, uh, medium uh, observation time and get the colors there. So if you don't have noise, this works perfectly. Uh, but uh, when you have noise, these the segments start to, to point to, uh, at funny directions and the things breaks down very quickly. So to solve for that, we made some additional hypothesis that the light curve should be smooth and the, refle the reflectance spectrum should also be smooth. Then we made a genetic algorithm to, to try to get that. So essentially what it does is to set uh, to seek sets of angular coefficients for the lines of, of segments of each filter so that the difference between adjacent segments of the light curve is smooth, uh, is minimal, so the light curve is smooth. The difference between the adjacent segments of the reflecting spectra is minimal, so the spectra is smooth. And also that the residuals to the observations are minimal, and also that the, the coefficients, uh, angular coefficients that use it are, co are compatible to the observations. So we don't get anything strange. Uh, then we can define some output, output parameters. One very useful is this uh, sigma ref which is a, a parameter that measures the smoothness of the uh, reconstructed spectra. So we made a bunch of uh, synthetic light capsule tests. We use uh, SIG models for real asteroids simulating high and low amplitude curves. Uh, we use reflected spectra calculated using haptic uh, models uh, and optical constants from metered spectra simulating uh, the templates for the, the uh, main classes. We use simulate magnitudes from 15 to 19, rotation periods from 2 to 16 hours. We use the J plus acquisition sequence with exposure times. And so we made a, a total of uh, 5,110 uh, 5, data sets for 15 different state models. Uh, since we know the spectra, because we're, we're making a light curve, we can uh, define a, a, a quality of uh, 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 the, the, the reconstruction for the reflecting spectra, which is delta ref. It's the difference between the, the reflecting spectra and the, the one you get reconstruction. So this is a light curve. So we have uh, just said in the top, we have the light curves of for two shape models. Uh, the colors represents uh, the, the uh, uh, one acquisition uh, uh, sequence for J plus. So we have several during the light curve. And then in the, in the bottom, we have the, the spectra for each acquisition section, sec, uh, segment, uh, sequence. So uh, the, the, the panel on the, the left, we have a, a light curve with very slow amplitudes, is 0 0.06 from top to top, uh, peak to peak. And uh, uh, because of that, of course, the spectra we get from all the points and the, 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 the rotation curve is mostly the same. Uh, in, the back, in the bottom, the original spectrum is in black. 
but on the right, we have now uh, a light curve for, with a amplitude of 0.6. And then you have, uh, you see that the, depending on what, uh, at the point of, of the light curve, you get your, your uh, J plus acquisition, you have a very different spectrum. And start seeing things that are very similar to the things we see on the data. So now we can apply uh, this uh, uh, genetic algorithm to this data set and see how it performs. So here we have a, a plot showing the signal ref, which is the smoothness parameter that, gets, that we get at the end of, of the, the, the construction, to the quality parameter. You see that both are very good, uh, they have a, there's a very good correlation between the two. So we, uh, from the signal ref, you can predict how, how well we succeeded in getting the right spectrum. So the colors represent different uh, magnitudes, and we see that uh, a slight uh, 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 different performance depending on the type of the, the, the asteroid. So we see here examples of the reconstruction in the, la in the right, left, sorry. We have this, this re left spectra, ref reflected spectra. So in black, we have the original spectra. In red, uh, what we get if you only average the, the observations on every age filter. And in green, we have the reconstruct reconstructed spectrum. And in the right, you have the light curve. The synthetic light curve is in black and the reconstructed one in green. So you see, we got very good results. We get much closer to the original spectrum, uh, unless we have uh, a light curve that have a concavity during the acquisition. That's the bottom panel. Uh, and for the, for in this case, we didn't perform as well, but that is expected. So we can also see how well we are re uh, recovering the amplitude of the light curve. So here we have a graphic that shows the amplitude of the synthetic light curve to the amplitude of reconstructed light curve. And again, one is a good predictor or the other. So uh, results for the reconstruction, it works. So this uh, sigma ref parameter is a good indication of how well we performed. And we, we get good results whenever we got sigma ref smaller than n. So now we can show some examples from there too. So here uh, on, on the left, we have this rift spectra and on the left, on the right, uh, the light curve. In blue, what we get if you just average the filters, in red, the reconstructed value. And again, they are sensible values, they're much, much closer to what we expect from the of asteroids and we, what we got if you only make the average of the filters. Same thing for uh, faint objects. So uh, great steps in future work. Uh, we have in place a pipeline for detection of moving objects and identification of no asteroids that have been tested successfully on there too. Uh, we have an algorithm for color light curve separation that uh, works well for anything brighter than G17. Uh, we are currently uh, processing the R3 data and we should have soon a paper and a, a, a thread catalog to publish. And we are also testing an algorithm to, algorithm to detect uh, unknown objects from J plus observations. So I'll stop here. Thank you. Okay, thanks, uh, Jorge. So is there any question or comment? Yeah, Ali. Uh, Oi, Jorge, Alessandro here. Uh, Hi. Th thanks for the thanks for the talk. Finally, an interesting presentation. Um, <laughs> I wanted, I, I'm interested about the technicalities here. Um, so what you are doing is you are downloading every uh, individual image and you run sex, uh, sex tractor on it or you download the individual uh, catalogs of each uh, individual exposure. Right. Uh, we download the catalogs for individual exposures. And then you use and then you and then you use what photometry from that. And so then, and what you, you do issue, right? Right. Uh, I have a mention that but what we do we we um, we use the photometry of the tiles to cross correlate the photometry for individual, individual frames, and then you derive a, a, a calibration for each frame using the, the photometry derived for the, the, the combined tiles of the catwalk. Cool, thanks. Yeah, no, just yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, so I'm curious that uh, in this case, the, the J plus observing strategy was was an important factor. The fact that the three uh, exposures were immediately after each other and all filters were in one line, almost. Um, so uh, in, in the case of uh, J plus, how would it go? Do you think uh, because it's going to be different? So the, the individual exposures are not going to be immediately after each other. Um, and uh, yeah, so how will it go with that? <laughs> I'm curious. 
So Jake Plaza is, is much more complicated. Uh, the, the problem we have, we have for Jake Plaza, we have four exposures for filter is better. Uh, the sequence will be random, but that's not really a problem. The thing is, uh, because we're doing uh, detrain for a uh, half a CCD, we're not sure exactly how that will work for, for moving objects. Because for Starling Galaxy, when you came back, the, the, the object will be there, be there and we should sure to get our filters for each object. As for move. So when you go back to get the, the, the other part of the spectra, they won't be there anymore. So it's not so clear exactly how that will work for asteroids. Yeah, so I think we can uh, stop here. Uh, so let's thank all the speakers for the session. We're coming back at, uh, at, at five straight. Okay, five o'clock. So we have 17 minutes of our coffee. Okay, so thank you very much, everyone, for uh, for coming after the coffee and uh, hopefully this last session of today before the breakout room. Um, uh, so uh, you already know Ariana; she's uh, she's been in JPAS for a long time. And uh, just before the introduction, I'd like to share some good news that she has uh, <laughs> just last week uh, become a, a full professor at uh, yes at the University of Rio de Janeiro. So let's give her a start. <laughs> <laughs> yes, congratulations, Ariana. So thank you very much for uh, talking about the morphological classification of 2000 galaxies in HS. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, okay, this work uh, has been done in collaboration with Fabrizio Ferrari, Rosa Gonzalez Delgado, and all the Gallagher group. And uh, is a work done with the IHS field only for the moment. So I will just describe briefly how we selected the sample because it's fundamental to have a catalog where we trust that all the uh, objects in the stamp that we are gonna process are actually galaxies. So also uh, we started with the, from the dual magnitude uh, catalog and we complemented this data with stellar population analysis from Gonzalez Delgado 2022 from uh, with the Amigo catalog of Maturi et al. in prep and Sigma-5 measurement of Lopez et al. in preparation. So we use the same condition as in Delgado et al. 2022, which is uh, uh, R band brighter than 22.75, probability of being a star lower than 0 0.5, and the photometric redshift lower than 1. Uh, then we also added the constraint to make sure that the galaxy is kind of resolved in the stamp. So we asked the full width of maximum of the galaxy divided by the full width of maximum of the PSF in every field is higher than two and that the signal to noise is higher than five, which is what is described in the figure in the bottom right of the panel I'm showing in here. Okay. And then I have visually inspected all those objects. And to do so, I subdivided them in other subsample uh, where I divided them in group of uh, effective radius, divided the full result maximum of the PSF in every field. And uh, as you can see on the right, I show galaxies with different resolutions. So on the top, they have uh, a resolution higher than two and then it goes down till 1.2. So basically it's already visible that when we have that the effective radius uh, is only 1.2 times the full result maximum of the PSF, the galaxies tend to be extremely faint and hard uh, to fit. So I stop at this moment. And, uh, but then we realized that we were missing some objects as I'm showing here. So the one with the red dots are the galaxies that are in our sample. And this one, for example, was not in our sample. So we went back and trying to find uh, an extra way to include these large objects that somehow were missed. Basically, we use this constraint described here. 
uh, where we ask that the count radius is higher than three and uh, the uh, redshift is lower than 0 0.8, but we remove all the constraint on the solution. And we end up with a catalog of 1,974 galaxies, which have been processed with morphometrica in GRI band. Here I'm showing uh, a distribution of the magnitude in our band of the uh, sample and the redshift distribution. And here is uh, when we obtain uh, the ratio between the effective radius of the galaxy and the uh, full width of maximum of the PSF um, using the output of morphometrica. So we can see that majority of our galaxies tend to be quite small, but we have large uh, objects. Okay. So we have actually 317 uh, with this ratio higher than two. Here an example of morphometrica output. I won't describe morphometrica in details, but uh, what uh, it uh, gives us are parametric and non-parametric measures of galaxies morphology. So here an example, we have an image, the model, the residual. This is a single cervix model. And then it creates asymmetry maps, a smooth map, the polar map, which is then used to obtain a measure of the spirality. And uh, uh, here is the list of all the parameters. And here I'm just pointing out that it's good uh, to see that somehow objects that are very similar as these two galaxies, they have a very similar single cervix fit. Uh, when you go and look at the asymmetry map, they tend to be very different. So uh, the combination of these parameters are powerful to understand galaxies morphologies. And here an example to compare our data with the uh, uh, HSD and CFHD data. So it's S plus on the right, CFHD in the middle and HSD, just to see the difference of course in resolution uh, for different redshifts. And here is a comparison with the work from Griffith et al using the HSD data. Uh, where they only uh, recover uh, CERCIC parameters, so the CERCIC index and effective radius. And here I'm showing a comparison of the CERCIC index re recovered uh, in HST data with Galapagos and with Morphometrica in the uh, mini JPAS data. It's color coded according to the magnitude in our band of the sources because as you can see, the scatter decreases a lot when we go uh, below, uh, above 20 magnitude. Yet it seems that uh, we tend to underestimate the subset index. And this can be uh, due to the fact that our resolution is likely, uh, well, is lower than in uh, HST. And here are some examples of all we can do with this huge table. And for example, we can look at the variation of morphometric parameter with color. This is concentration. In blue is the G band, R is red, and I band is green. And when we use another parameter as sigma psi, we can see that even more we can see a trend uh, with this parameter changing with band because sigma psi is very sensitive to a presence of spiral arms. So it's stronger in G band. And here uh, is just a warning that, of course, uh, these, uh, all these codes, all these methods are limited by resolution uh, and depth of the survey. So here is a work from the Albernas Ferreira 2018, where they simulated um, galaxies at higher redshift to use SDSS, DES, LSST, and HST data in order to recover their ability of recovering uh, morphological parameters using morphometrica. And uh, so here is to see that for us is important uh, the pixel scale. So somehow I think it is related to uh, the beaming uh, as we were discussing before. And here is an example from them of uh, simulating redshifted objects. And uh, if we assume that we are relatively similar to this, uh, we can see here that uh, these parameters allow us to recover correctly morphology up to redshift 0 0.5. Of course, we can explore to higher redshift, but this is just to be on the safe side. 
So I will present some result uh, in this one. So I'm here I'm uh, restricting myself to redshift lower than 0 0.5 and magnitude uh, higher than 20, brighter than 20. So here is concentration uh, versus uh, entropy and is color coded with a specific star formation. We can see that galaxies that have high concentration and low entropy, so low clumpiness, low presence structure. So probably elliptical tend to be less star forming that objects uh, that are probably spiral galaxies that have low concentration and high entropy. And this is the same uh, looking at the integrated U minus R color and is a similar result. And here uh, we show uh, other two, another parameter, which is M20. Uh, all of this is in the I band till now versus concentration and is color coded with the median mass. And we can see that objects that have higher concentration and lower M20 tend to have uh, higher masses. So the concentration and M20 are good tracer of the galaxy mass are related to the galaxy mass. On the other side, when we want to go and look at the environment, things are more complicated. So I follow a suggestion of Rosa of uh, combining the probability from Maturi et al, from Amigo, of being associated with the cluster and uh, uh, or the field uh, with uh, uh, the value of sigma five. So I'm taking only objects that are isolated as objects that have uh, um, probability of association zero, zero and uh, log n of sigma five lower than 0 0.5 at this one here, and the opposite for the ones that are in clusters in high density environment. So this is the same plot as before, now divided between isolated and cluster galaxies. Of course, the number of objects decreases every time more, but maybe we can see a trend for objects in cluster being more toward the elliptical part of this plot, as we would expect. And also we can explore other parameters that I can be more or less sensitive uh, to the environment. It's interesting that sigma psi tend to be, uh, again, more uh, uh, affected by, in this case, the environment when we go to the uh, G band. And finally, uh, here I'm uh, doing another plot, uh, as in Puentas Carrera et al, uh, where I'm uh, showing uh, the location of galaxies that are isolated on cluster in the asymmetry versus concentration plane. And here on the right, you can see how they divided the galaxies uh, in different uh, morphological type uh, using this diagram. Of course, this is something that has to be explored more. But if we do the same as they do with the lines, we see that we have some objects that could be irregular or merging objects, both in cluster and in isolation. Majority of the galaxies in isolations are in the spiral group, while here we have elliptical hemispheres. And something that we could do uh, with a lot of care is exploring the evolution of redshift uh, in redshift of these morphological parameters, as I'm showing here, is the concentration entropy diagram color coded with the photometric redshift, where we can see that maybe there is a trend in this diagram with redshift, and that's all. Thank you very much. Thank you for finishing uh, on great time. I have three or four minutes for questions, so please. We have all raised their hands. Ah, on, online. Okay, so online, I didn't see who raised their hands. Edward? Uh, congratulations, Adriana. I think I missed something in the beginning. So uh, which which uh, uh, bands are you using for the, the morphological analysis? So now we, have, uh, we are using only GRI. We have been... Uh, can see. Yes. So, uh, in case we have only uh, the I band imaging, uh, can you still do your your uh, the same the same work? So, uh, well, uh, it's possible to do it also on broadband. So, it's uh, something that we did so with only few example uh, is running. You can run it on all uh, narrow bands as well. 
as much as you can try to combine the narrow band, that's something we were discussing time ago in a Gallevol meeting, you can combine the narrow band to recreate a broadband somehow as well. So yes, I think it will be possible to find ways uh, around it. Okay, but I think you would benef benefit as well if the broadband is done by under good sync conditions, don't you? Uh, uh, that's for sure. <laughs> Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, Alexis. Um, so you're using the Sigma Phi parameter. Um, I think it would be important to, to um, run this Sigma Phi estimator also on the mock uh, together with our uh, detect, detect, uh, detecting chains to actually see how much extra information the Sigma Phi that brings to the specification of the environment. Because so, in, some point, in some point, you already, you know, I think that, I think um, it's kind of a, a bit of a duplicate, okay? And we need, um, and it's a combination of, of being in a, in a cluster and being slightly away from the cluster. So it, it's, um, it would be important, you know, I, I understand what you're doing. You're running standard algorithm. This algorithm is 30 years old. We have the ability now to actually bring some understanding in what this actually means. And I think this work can be done. It has not been done, but I'm, I'm, you know, it's more, it's more like you know, some ideas of how we can, we can bring some more, under, more light into this uh, work. Yeah, uh, it's a very nice idea. I didn't run uh, um, uh, the code to obtain neither Sigma-5, like I, we only worked on the morphological parts and we combined with other uh, catalogs that were in the um, available. So actually it's, it's Paolo Lopez that ran, uh, uh, that obtained uh, sig the Sigma-5 parameters. So I think we could uh, speak with him about it, but I think it's an interesting point. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so we have to move on. Uh, uh, the next speaker is Leonardo Vieira Costa. Leonardo, are you there? I don't see him. No. Is he? I see you there. Yes, yes. <laughs> can you Hello? hear me as well? Yes, 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 we hear you perfectly. You can try okay. sharing. Let, let me only see how I share the screen here. Okay. Okay. So Leonardo is going to talk about galaxy shape measurement methods for the JPAS survey. Thank you very much, Leonardo. You can start. OK, let me just achieve the pen and close this thing here. OK, hello, everyone. My name is Leonardo Vieira Costa. I am from University of Sao Paulo. And today, I would like to talk about galaxy shape measure methods for the GPS survey. So first of all, what is uh, the scientific motivation to do these uh, shape measurements. Normally for galaxies, the average of ellipsity is random oriented. So in this case here, we expect that the ellipsities is equal to zero. However, the presence of weak lensing introduces a bias on this average. So in this case, we expect a shear value that changed the, the format of the galaxies. And this shear value could be uh, ellipsity E1, a composition between ellipsity E1 and E2. And we can see in this image how this manifests in distortions. And in the case of galaxy cluster, these distortions are perpendicularly oriented to the center of the cluster. We can use these ellipsities to calibrate the optical mass proxies by staked weak lensing technique and determine cosmological parameters using galaxy cluster counts. And today, the state of art are the 40 feet methods for the shear measurements. They are very appealing, although they are very CPU time consuming. So for example, in a test we did using 40 feet methods, it took about seven seconds per galaxy and as we expect a total of four to six times 10 to power seven galaxies in the JPS, it would take about nine to 13 CPU years to be computed the shape measurement for these galaxies. And it's a problem, we need to go faster or we could spend more money faster computer. And today I want to introduce to you two techniques that can be used for shape measurement for galaxies. 
One is the KSB with regaussianization. So from the light distribution I, we can compute the quadrupolar moments. They are used to measure the size and ellipses of galaxies. And one way to perform this calculation is through the Gaussian mode called HSM. And another uh, option that you can use are the convolutional neural networks, uh, convolutional neural network, or just CNN. It's a machine learning technique, very useful to get information from images. In this case, you are interested in ellipses. And we can use, and sorry, we use in this case an efficient net to calculate these ellipses. And we can compare the shape measurement from these two methods using a deep survey. In this case, we choose CFGT lens, which will be our validation data in these two cases. So here, uh, mini JPS galaxy and the same galaxy in the CFGT lens uh, survey. As you can see, it has a better resolution, a better signal to noise. So it's a good for validation to us. In the case of ESB, we start with the total 64,000 objects from mini JPS catalog. We did cuts in, we remove, for example, artifacts, uh, problematic objects, flag objects and stuff like that. And we also choose only objects with signal to noise ratio bigger than 10. We also remove point sources like stellar locus and everything that seems to be a star. And we also did cuts in resolution factor. This resolution factor is a parameter given by KSB. And it is basically how uh, an object is um, related to the PSF. So we use the T sizes. This T size is close to the area of an object. So if your object is very uh, related to the PSF, this value is up close to zero. And if it's well resolved, it's close to one. So we did this cut here. And we did the good, uh, the, we select good fit objects in the CFJT lens catalog. And with this cut here, we can do the KCB regals measurements and compare it with CFJT lens measurements. And we can do a linear fit on it and compute the Pearson coefficient, which is a parameter that is uh, closer to one if this slope here is closer to one, two. So it represents how well this linear fit is. And we can create now uh, catalogs with ellipses and other size information and combine it with the information provided by mini JPS as well. And we did a lot of systematic checks to confirm if these shear catalogs are good to be used. In this case, we did a lot of tests and we see that our band not only has more objects that pass through our thresholds, but also performs better in shape measurements. So we choose to move with our band and we also did this several new tests to verify the quality of our shape catalog. These tests involve us, for example, compare correlations between uh, shear measurements and the T size of the PSF or ellipses of the PSF correlation and signal to noise correlations and more uh, correlations that we can do. And as we can see it here, there is no statistically significant leakage that can uh, affect the ellipses of the galaxy from this catalog. And this test shows that the system marks are most below the expected statistical error for cluster counts that we are interested to do. We also did tests in the row statistics. These tests, it's a uh, quality control for the PSF quality. These measurements represent the correlations between residuals and the PSF and its residuals, and it's preferably to be closer to zero. In this case, we our thresholds are based in, in Mandebao 2018, which is a HSC survey. In this case, these thresholds here, uh, they are more focused on cosmic shear measurements. And in this case, these constraints are more stringent than the constraints for 
cluster counts, for example. So in this case, we can be more permissive in these limits. And of course, we have uh, less data than HSC. Anyway, our test seems to be very good in this case, considering the uncertainties. So it is uh, a good sign for this catalog. And we also did another test, which are PSF leakage based on alpha parameter. This alpha parameter here is given by this equation, which is the correlations between galaxy shapes and PSF and auto correlations between the PSF and ellipses. And once we shared similar criteria in the uncertainties of sigma eight with Jarvis 2016, we can use the same thresholds for alpha, which are 3% if you want to be more strict and 10% if you want to be more softer. And in this paper here, they also did the thresholds for cosmic shear and our case is more, uh, not so high, I don't need to go so hard for these thresholds. But in this case, we also have, because of uncertainties, uh, compatibility with the threshold. So it's a good sign as well. And here, we have uh, the fact if you do not correct by PSF, you see this offset here in this case. And move on. In the case of convolution neural network, our idea is to give to the CNN images of galaxies and also the images of the PSF. And we try to train the CNN to give us E1 and E2 from the shape of these galaxies here. We test this. Uh, individual bands and also a combination between them. And we have this result here, like the KSB, we compare the CNN shape measurements and the CF80 lens measurements. And we also compute the uh, Pearson coefficient here. We also can correct this offset here by residuals. And we compare these two methods now. The CNN, when it is done with only one band, it performs worst in comparison to the KSB in the R band. But if you use a combination with three bands, the CNN performs better than KSB, especially in signal to noise ratio less than 15. And this region here, we have more faint galaxies. So we have more objects here. So it's a good sign to use CNN, but we saw no difference if you use PSF or, P or not, PSF images to the CNN. So this is a problem here. And we can compare these two methods here in the last slide. And about CPU processing time, our CNN takes uh, 0 0.06 seconds per galaxy and KCB takes 0 0.019 seconds. So our CNN is three times faster. It has a quite bigger Pearson coefficient during the CFH lens validation data, but the CNN demands three bands to reach these results and KSB only needed only one band. We can use multi band in KSB, but it's not so simple. And it also could uh, increase this processing time here. In the case of output data, the CNN only gives E1 and E2 and KSB using HSM could give us not only E1 and E2, but also resolution factors, sigma size, errors, and other parameters. And KSB who is able to do the correction of the PSF. And our CNN is unable to do the correction, but we have some idea why, it's why this is happening. So we are studying to do neural network corrections of PSF, so this Pearson coefficient could be better in the case of CNN. And finally, if you want this catalog uh, with ellipses and other shape measurements for galaxies, you can send me an email. And thank you for your attention. And I'm here for your doubts. Thank you very much, Leonardo. So any questions? Yes, Rosa. Uh, sorry, uh, Silvia. <laughs> uh, hi, Leonardo. Thanks a lot. So, uh, uh, I guess, uh, like, uh, the first question that comes up is, uh, uh, if the past observes only one broadband, one broadband, so would you need, um, is it, uh, you know, would it work then only with the slower method? 
or you could still use uh, maybe bands from other surveys. I mean, I guess you need you know the bands a similar quality, right? Or uh, or is two K only one as a good uh, uh, you know quality, uh, image quality? When we use uh, G band, we have worse results. Uh, in case B and for CNN and R band it's better, but I band is not so different in this case. But G band uh, performs worst for us. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yes, Alexander. Uh, well, since Sylvia stole my question, I'll just I'll just make a comment. If you want, you can always make your catalog available as a value-added catalog through the UPA. Um, in fact, what I, in fact, the way you should see it is a catalog doesn't exist um, in the J universe if it's not in the UPA. It's virtually useless. Okay. Just mm -hmm. if you want to promote your work, get in touch with us. We can make your catalog available through our system. So everybody ah. can use it. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, because we uh, just as an advertisement uh, for those who may not know, the the database we have here is connected to the virtual observatory. You can connect with any other catalog on the on the planet that follows the standard. So, <laughs> so it's really good to to upload it here and uh, yeah, uh, make it. Is it published? Uh, is the work? I didn't see if it's. Uh, have you published a paper on it yet? Ah, not yet. It's my. <laughs> Uh, I wouldn't say it's my master dissertation. Ah, um, okay. <laughs> I work with it. Okay, okay, then good. So as soon as you get the paper out, uh, send the page, send the catalog here. So we have wonderful services to host it uh, and okay. share it. Okay, thank you very much. So the next speaker is welcome. Bye bye. <laughs> Ah, vale. Okay. Okay. Well, the, I'm going to present a, a, a work which is in progress. Is only to show the beautiful also data that we have in the JetNet data in the JetNet uh, observation. So I'm also um, to show the the all the powerful tool that we have already built for mini j -Pass that can be very easily to apply to the j -Net. And we hope that will be applied soon to the j -Pass in general. Mm -hmm. So let me to show the sample that uh, I was using. It is um, uh, more than 3,000 galaxy that were simply um, selected by the total prop star, less than 0.5. Um, photo C less than, than one. So here it is the, the distribution of the magnitude of the object, the error in the R band, the resi distribution, and also the plane resi versus the, the magnitude as a function of the, uh, of the signal to noise. Um, on the right, you can find the similar plot that, <laughs> that we have already obtained for mini j -pass. There is a clear difference with respect to that well. You cannot see it because it is over there. <laughs> but the, but the, believe me, the, the error in the R band, it is about half of the error that we have in mini JPAS. So the, the, the data are deeper and better for to do the, the set fitting that we are performing to estimate the property of the galaxy. Uh, also, there is a, another difference in this plane with respect to mini j -bar. You see that here there is a, a bunch of um, a bright galaxy that we didn't detect here, but probably because they are missing in the, in the catalog. Um, okay, that's one example of the object. This is a very early type galaxy and a spiral with the star formation. And also we have here a more compact galaxy, which is very blue. Remember that the, the color is the, uh, the data that we have, and the, the star is the broadband um, data that we have already too. And the, and the dot, the small dot, is the fitting that we are performing to estimate the, 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 the property of the, of the galaxy. 
there is a, a lot of galaxy that is so clearly H alpha in emission. And here you cannot see either, but there is H alpha and nitrogen two, oxygen three, and also it's looking like that it could be some oxygen two. Okay, remember that we have, uh, you see the basic gal co um, code, which is a variation Markov machine Monte Carlo code. We use a parametric star formation history. In the case we are using as in mini JPAD the delay tau model. So that's the, the residual after fitting the 3200 uh, object. Um, <clears throat> and that's the distribution of the G squared reduced, which is around one, which is that means that we are fitting well. And also the distribution of the uh, different in magnitude between the fitting and the observation with respect to the error, which is also uh, around zero. And also the, the standard deviation is uh, equal to one. So that means that in that case, we don't have problem with the, with the error in the estimation of the error that we had at the beginning with the many j pass. Okay, this is another example of the of the galaxy it looks to me that could be a, a group of, ga of galaxy there are a similar similar resi also we cannot see here but that there is a strong h alpha oxygen 3 here it is also h alpha oxygen 3 oxygen 2 h alpha oxygen 2 so um, that in that case not so clear because, because it is really uh, fainter um, but uh, probably there is a H alpha at least in, in, in emission. There is a lot of OJ. Oh yeah, I was uh, really surprised that only looking by eyes, uh, you can find a lot of OJ oh yeah, where they are detected uh, H alpha or any other oxygen 3 in, uh, in emission. That's another example. This is three galaxy that also has a similar resin, maybe also a group or a triplet of galaxy that it is in interaction, something like this. Again, uh, for the resin, we cannot uh, detect the H alpha because it not, it's not in the pastoral range. But uh, clearly, oxygen three, oxygen two, um, the the also here. Okay, so um, with respect to the property, with the uh, fitting, we can estimate the the stellar mass, the ages of the stellar population, the extinction, the metallicity, the rest frame color, color corrected by extinction, and also the these two parameters of the star formation history. Here it is the distribution for the net, and in dash line, I represented the distribution from the mini J pass, scaling to the to to the number of galaxies that we have in in net. You see that there are no significant difference. The distribution are quite similar, and we see again the the this B model distribution, which is characteristic of this uh, of this field. That's something that we can see again here in the plane color intrinsic color versus the stellar mass, where um, the plot um, is the color is uh, representing the specific star formation rate. So and clear, we see again the bimodal distribution of galaxy. Uh, on the right, we are expressing the, um, the, the galaxy as a function also the, um, in the ages of the stellar population. We clearly detect a big uh, blue cloud um, also, the, the rest sequence of uh, galaxy, which is about the dash line, which is the limit. And also, we just put in here the galaxy that we uh, consider that could be in the Green Valley and um, can be classified as transition galaxy because they have a still blue color, but the specific star formation rate is below 2.1 per year. Again, it is quite similar to the mini result that we have already obtained. So um, uh, similarly, we have the, the main sequence where it is all the blue galaxy that are, we are detecting and also the, the, the rest sequence and the transition um, galaxy. And on the right, you can see which is the distribution of the evolution of the property, the, the mass, the ages of the stellar population and the tau over TO parameter. Remember, these two parameters, the ratio is an indication of how, for how long is progressing the star formation in the galaxy, or also we can interpret it as if the, it is very small, 
is because the galaxy has already quenched the star formation. This is what happened when we divided the sample in red galaxy and blue galaxy. There is a significant difference between the, the two parameters. And also we see how evolved with the recit uh, for the ages and the, and the stellar mass. Here is came the first surprise comparison with the mini J pass because we just represented the fraction of galaxy, the blue galaxy, as a function of the resi and the red uh, galaxy. This is uh, complementary, I mean. Um, and that's the comparison with the mini J pass. We see here that the, this fraction it is uh, around uh, 0.1, which is quite s a small. Um, and we don't have this increase in the in the in the fraction of red galaxy that we see in the mini J pass. This is something different. I don't know if it is because we are losing some galaxy or, or also because the, the field of view is very small. So um, and could be some um, uh, cosmic variance in the in the stellar population property. Okay. Let's also apply the technique that has been developed by, by Hines in his thesis to retrieve which is the galaxy that they have uh, H-alpha um, emission and can be uh, classified um, as uh, star forming or uh, AGNs. So that's the, after applying the artificial neural network code, this is the distribution of the, of the galaxy in the equivalent width of the H-alpha. And here again, in the plane of color and mass, but uh, the, the color of the, of the point is related with the equivalent width of the uh, H-alpha in emission. And the site of the, of, the, of the point, it is related with the ratio between the uh, tau and T0. Um, this is in, in agreement what we expected. In the blue cloud, it is mainly dominated by the um, object with the larger uh, equivalent width of H alpha, and in the red sequence, it is dominated by a um, galaxy with a small um, equivalent width of H alpha, and also with a small value of the um, tau over T0, suggesting that this uh, uh, H alpha emission that we are detecting probably is not related with the star formation. Uh, uh, recent star formation in the galaxy, it is related with the uh, possible presence of uh, an AGS in the, in the galaxy. Oh, uh. Okay, so that's here again, the, the using the methodology by Hines, we use the BPT, we, we measure the oxygen 3, H beta, nitrogen 2, H alpha, and this is the BBT uh, diagram. This is the, the, the classical curve uh, by Kaufman and Curie to separate the star forming galaxy from the Cipher galaxy or the Rainer uh, uh, galaxy. We also had used the, the wall and diagram that instead of using oxygen 3 over H beta, which is more difficult to, to measure, we are using the equivalent width of H alpha with respect to the ratio of nitrogen 2 over H alpha. Um, that line also is separating the star forming, which is on the left, with respect to the Cipher galaxy, which is on the right, or to the liner population, or the retired galaxy. That means galaxy that has some still um, H alpha emission, but in reality, they don't have any, any AGS. Okay, the, the next step that we have applied to the to this uh, field is to look up for the presence of a group and to characterize, to characterize the, the property of this galaxy. For that, we are using the result from Amico that Ma Mateo sent it to me a week ago, so <laughs> this is very new. That's the distribution of the galaxy that it belongs to the group with respect to the distribution of the galaxy that it is in the, in the field. This is a density map of the of the there is around 23 groups in this uh, mm -hmm. in this uh, field um, here on the right you can see some of the of the group that has been selected by by amico that's another example there there is two galaxies one is this quite blue clearly with a h alpha 
well, no H alpha, oxygen three and oxygen two, because for the rest we cannot detect it H alpha. And the other galaxy, which is uh, quite red. Okay, so we have measured the the, the number of galaxies per uh, each group in comparison with the uh, mini J pass and also the mass of the of the group by the number of galaxies and also for the for the mass of that uh, the total mass of the group a stellar mass I mean um, is uh, uh, clearly uh, groups and also it is uh, quite similar to the result that we have obtained for mini J band. You see that the stellar mass is quite the mean of the stellar mass and the number of galaxies almost equal. Also, does the, the distribution of the property of the, of the galaxy that belong to the group, which is in, in purple, <coughs> with respect to the whole distribution or the field population with this in dashed line? As expected, and we have already found in mini J pass, there is a, a clear shift in the, in the stellar mass, something in the, in the ages of the stellar population, and obviously, clearly, they are a shift in the, in the, in the color uh, distribution. That's, the, that's mainly due to the, to the red galaxy that we have in the, in the sample that belong to the, to the group. With respect to because the, the field population they show uh, the blue field population is quite similar to the blue population that we see in the in the uh, in the in groups. Um, here, where we have found a very surprise in the result uh, on the right, it is the result from uh, Mini J pass where we just uh, mm, represented the fraction of red galaxy which is in red, uh, that belong to groups with respect to the red galaxy that it is in the field. And the conclusion here, um, the blue is for blue galaxy. And the conclusion here was that the, there is an increase uh, due to the environment effect of the number of uh, quenched galaxy or red galaxy. Um, also here, uh, it is for quench galaxy, which is in four group with respect to the, uh, the to the field. When we go to the to the net, we see that there is no difference between the the the, the group and the field. Um, also, there is no difference uh, when we look at the the fraction of quench quench galaxy. So. I have a okay. I have a few slides that I was preparing, comparing also with some result of the JS web, but because we have a later a discussion, I will I will do later. So, okay, but let me to finish with something that it is not related with this, but I couldn't resist. <laughs> so I'm very sorry. Now, okay, remember that yesterday is because yesterday I didn't show the 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 first slide of the week. But yesterday I saw this um, field where here it is the Stefan Quintet, and here it is uh, uh, the observation that I have done the, for the JS web. That's the, the, field, um, the field of view of the uh, light view of width. And here there is some example of different uh, spectra that has been taken for, for for this galaxy that has two, two nucleus. <laughs> Clearly, the, the data are very spectacular because they, for the cinematic, they can separate very clearly the different component of the, of the galaxy. The kinematics is, uh, well, it is uh, 10,000, <laughs> the, the resolution. So that means that quite different. And here, uh, it is the, 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 the velocity map uh, over the, the images for this galaxy. So that means that uh, in some aspect, we cannot compete with this kind of data. But uh, I think we can do a lot of work with the JPAS data because uh, I don't know it will do all the galaxy. Also, we don't know it will do the, 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 the intergalactic uh, intercluster medium. So there is a lot of uh, aspect that can be done with the JPAS, although we cannot have the, the kinematic. And that's the final message. Thank you very much.
very much. Unfortunately, there's no time. <laughs> so, uh, we're already one minute beyond the okay. 15 minutes. But we discussion, no? Yeah, we had a discussion. Yes, yeah, yes. We can discuss in the, the net uh, result in the... Yes, after. After. Yes. yes. Okay. Okay. So, following the the routine of professor, graduate student, professor, and now another graduate student. So, this is I'm happy to uh, present Nishal. He's working in San Sebastian, Sylvia. Uh, so, he's going to be talking about the two D properties of X-ray agent in the local universe. Okay, okay. So, hi everyone. I am Michel. Um, I am a PhD student of uh, Sylvia in uh, DIPC in San Sebastian. And I'm using the mini JPAS data to study the 2D properties of um, X ray silicate agents in the local universe within received uh, 0 0.3. I'm also co supervised by uh, Mara Salvato from MP. And um, yeah, that's it. So, um, I, I don't have to cover this slide, but I just want to mention quickly that um, because this might come out later in, when we uh, when I show the samples that the EGS uh, field is a bit narrower than the mini JPAS field. Uh, so the samples that we see later on in, uh, in this work would be very much concentrated in this uh, rectangular area of the EGS field. Um, yeah, so. Rosa already talked about this yesterday that how we can use uh, the JPAS mini JPAS data for uh, IFU kind of studies. And uh, yes, yeah, so that is what I'm doing with the uh, uh, with the mini JPAS data. Um, so the one of the concept of this is that when we use um, all these uh, IFU surveys that are like Manga or Khalifa, they are one of the things is that they are very expensive to. Uh, operate. The other thing is like um, we don't have a lot of samples uh, covered by them. We have, but like not in the magnitude of what the JPAS would cover in the future. And the, also the other thing is um, with these IFUs, uh, we have very, let's say like not biased, but like in a kind of a way biased uh, objects because like we just want to study your object and like we apply for a time and get the Spectroscopy design a few maps for these mm -hmm. objects, and uh, maybe the results that we get from all of these studies are kind of maybe biased by our let's say supervised uh, selection of uh, samples. So yeah, with uh, JPAS, maybe we can bridge this gap between uh, the very high quality provided by the uh, dedicated IFU surveys, and um, we can uh, use the JPAS data to do a lot more statistical studies on like thousands, ten thousands of objects uh, in the future. So, um, uh, the aim of my project is to study the radial variation of stellar properties between um, uh, agents and non-Asian uh, host galaxies. So, uh, the way we select our agents is we cross-match the counterparts of uh, uh, the sources in mini chepas galaxies with uh, the counterparts of uh, uh, XMM Newton and Chandra surveys. Uh, here uh, is uh, in, a, in this small plot, I show this uh, work by uh, Ivan Lopez. Uh, he uh, recently submitted his work, which is also based on mini JPAS, and he has compiled a catalog of all the um, X ray sources that are present in uh, the field of uh, mini JPAS. So, um, yeah, so all of these uh, objects that are brighter than magnitude 21 and there are within spectroscopic dead shift of 0 0.3 and there are all the objects that are uh, greater than one arc second in apparent size. So all of these are extra samples. Uh, you see all of these uh, diamonds here. Um, and what we're going to do is we want to compare uh, unbiased, uh, select, uh, unbiased uh, control sample to uh, compare the properties of these uh, AGN samples with. So um, here in this plot, I show you the plot of uh, uh, BPD diagram for all of our mini chepas objects. That is also again done by a student of Rosa uh, uh, Kines, if I'm not wrong. Uh, and uh, here, what we do is we uh, choose only the samples that are within uh, this uh, 
QD uh, that are below this Kaufman line for our control samples. And there are also selected on the same criteria of uh, there are um, greater than 21 in magnitude within 0.3 respect to the shift, and there are also bigger than one arc second in apparent size. So uh, in total, we have uh, 36 uh, samples of uh, extra Asian host galaxies. And to compare all these results with, we have a control sample of uh, 200 uh, normal galaxies that do not host any Asians in the center. Um, so, uh, these are the uh, properties of uh, all of our samples. Here is the distribution of redshift um, on the <coughs> x-axis, and y-axis shows the um, fraction of uh, these objects. On here, this is the distribution of same measure in arc seconds, and this one is the distribution of same measure in kiloparsecs. Uh, on the right side plot, I show you the actual luminosities of all of our uh, X-ray Asian uh, host galaxies. And as you might see that most of our galaxies are um, weak uh, in X-ray, they don't emit very high X-ray, so they're probably weak um, X-ray AGNs. Um, so here is a few of our very good uh, samples, uh, in images at least, that we see in the mini Shepas uh, field. Uh, all of these X-rays on the bottom uh, row and the uh, uh, rightmost column. These are our uh, X-ray samples, and all of these in the centers, they are our control samples. So a beautiful collection of all of these extended objects that uh, we further apply these IFU-like ideas to study these uh, ra uh, radial profiles. Uh, but one of the problems when we uh, study the stellar properties of uh, our objects, especially with Asians, is that we most most of the times contaminate the uh, the fluxes with the light of the age coming from the Asians. So uh, to remove this um, um, biasness, uh, how how do I say, contamination by the Asian, what we do is we uh, model our all of our uh, images in all of these different narrowband filters. Uh, with uh, this component, a bulge component, and a central nuclear component. And the idea is that this nuclear component would uh, give us the magnitude of the agents, and we subtract this uh, nuclear component from our uh, images, and then uh, we get the final uh, uh, images that would be ready for uh, these IFU-style studies. Uh, so here, this is just an example of uh, our one of these uh, uh, X-ray Asian galaxies. All of these top five rows, uh, this shows the different uh, images in different filters. This is the model that is created by uh, uh, Galfit in uh, multi-wavelength, Galfit M, and this is the residual. So uh, the idea is that when we uh, de deduct, when we subtract this model from the image, then we should uh, get a blank image uh, that you can see on this uh, uh, bottom five rows. Here. And this is another example of uh, another X-ray Asian galaxy that we have. Uh, on the top, uh, this uh, rows show the image. This is the model, and this is the uh, residual image that is pretty flat out here. Um, here, this is image. This is, uh, I also show you the uh, result of uh, SED fitting using Sigale. Uh, this, uh, this is uh, all of these uh, color coded uh, points are our. Uh, Observations and all of these circles that you see here are uh, the uh, best fit models for all of these fluxes from which we derive our uh, stellar properties. Uh, so after doing this, uh, these steps of uh, image minus model and residual and removing, removing this PSF uh, component, uh, the nuclear component, uh, this is what we get. So. Uh, as you can see, after the subtraction of this nuclear component, we move almost 0.25 magnitudes uh, on the less bright, a dimmer side uh, of in these all of these uh, X-ray Asian components, X-ray Asian galaxies, and yeah, we this is the distribution, the purple one slash blue one, uh, the distribution of the control samples of uh, 200 objects. Um, so. After going through these steps, what we do is we take a galaxy, we divide it into different spatial bins, different radial bins, and we extract 
the spectra for each of these uh, radial beams. So, for example, here, the this red uh, center has this spectra right here. This uh, yellow bin has this spectra right here. This green one has this one, and, and so on. So as you can see, like when we go out to the outskirts of uh, galaxies, like for example, in this one, when you move to the uh, last most uh, bin, we don't get a very good uh, signal to noise ratio. So we discard these and we, for now, we have limited our studies into only up to 1.75 uh, effective radii. So yeah, after this, the pretty simple steps, we just uh, fit each of these uh, <coughs> spectra into uh, we do a CD fitting on each of these uh, spectra using uh, Sigale. They can also include these extra fluxes that you see here. So what you see here is an example of uh, the flux for the center of this galaxy right here. Here you can see the uh, flux in the X-ray. This is the JPAS pins and this is uh, JPAS fluxes. And this is the um, uh, focus the zoomed in of this uh, uh, section here. So uh, this is a result for all of our galaxies in the integrated mode. We have a pretty similar distribution, but we can see here in this uh, SSFR histogram that the extra samples are a bit more uh, quenched than when compared to the control samples. And just like moving on to the most important results here, yeah, I, move, I show you this. Uh, what you see here are violin plots. So what this distribution shows is the distribution of mass on all of these 36 uh, bins, on these 36 uh, get 36 central bins of 36 X-rays in galaxies. And this one shows the distribution of uh, 36, uh, 200 radial, 200 central bins of the control galaxies, and, and so on, like uh, this is. So what you see here is, uh, on the y-axis, this is the stellar mass density, and on the, y and on the x-axis is the uh, effective radii. So in all of these beams, so we see the stellar mass is a lot more denser in the X-ray objects compared to the control samples. And uh, similar to uh, results that we see in the SFR density. And I guess this is obvious because stellar mass and SFR, they have a pretty linear relation. But where it gets interesting is when you see this uh, 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 this profile of uh, the specific star formation rate density. So on the y-axis is uh, specific star formation rate density, uh, x-axis is uh, effective radii. And what you see is the control samples are a, lot, a bit more star forming than the actual samples. But also we see a lot larger drop when you move from the central bin to the second bin of the X-ray selected agents, then compared to the control samples. And yeah, so why, 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 what would this be because of maybe all the gas going out because of the agents, uh, jets, um, I don't know, what, whatever reasons that uh, you can think of. And uh, yeah, so we also in the end divided these into a few more. Uh, samples of the control into control composites and control star forming based on the BBD diagram. And also another interesting result is that these control samples, they follow a very close profile to the control star forming sample, whereas the control <coughs> composites, they follow a very close profile to the extra sample. And you can see this in the uh, mass and uh, star formation rate. And also when it comes to the specific star, star formation rate, we can see the same uh, kind of profiles. Uh, and yeah, so mm -hmm. I had to go a bit quick in this, but that's it from my side. Okay, thank you, thank you. Very much. <laughs> one more slide. Just one more slide. I, I, okay. I have a question or slide. Which one do you prefer? <laughs> <laughs> just um, quick. Okay. The future is uh, this. So, like from this uh, mini Chepas galaxies. Uh, IFU map, and when we have more samples, then we can do this for all of them. But yeah. this, if, if you have, if you have time for questions. Okay, fast, fast question. Uh, yes, Alexis. Uh, so, which line do you use for to get the star formation? Right. Uh, we don't use uh, these uh, fluxes. We just use the um, estimates of the star formation rate from uh, uh, that is given by Sigale. At, uh, uh, I was wondering how much I mean, 
Mm. I don't know. I mean, like, at least I know that uh, Sigali accounts for the. It's only a few percent. It did not attempt to use Yeah. No AGM. Sigali cannot find it. It's less than 5%, so it's meaningless. Huh. Well, uh, at least, like, X Sigali can find, like, we account for AGM. The X, yes, that's mm -hmm. the only thing you could find. There's no other way, like, where Sigali could find anything that you could say is AGM. Hmm. The one you showed has absolutely nothing. Mm, for example, like here, if you see this uh, fit here. I mean, I guess you mean the luminosities, right? Excellent. For example, there, there's an example. Okay, the AGN is uh, three orders of magnitude. I mean, it's nothing. Mm. It's just nothing. E even if it was 20 times more, it'd still be nothing. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is good to follow up later. Thank you very much. Okay. <laughs>